and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, the expert conference on vaccination is going to start shortly. If you can please start making your way to your seats. We will start the proceedings in a few minutes. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellencies, dear distinguished guests. My name is Vít Pohanka. I am a journalist, mostly for the Czech National Public Radio, but uh, I have the privilege uh, to be a kind of presenter and moderator to your meetings here today and tomorrow. Let me welcome you in the, uh, in the beautiful capital of the Czech Republic, for the expert meeting under the Czech presidency, which concentrates on vaccination. Now, obviously, I'm sure that you had a good time, I mean, to have a look at all the materials. Uh, so without, without much ado, let me ask uh, His Excellency, the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister of Health of the Czech Republic, Mr. Vlastimil Malek, to make a few introductory remarks. Thank you, Minister. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the last expert conference in the Czech presidency in the field of health. 
We started our expert meetings in the summer in my hometown, in Brno, where we address the main challenges to modern cancer control. Cancer is my issue, and because I am a radiologist, oncoradiologist, cancer is something like part of my heart. Nevertheless, in October, we invited European experts to draw attention to rare disease, and rare diseases are also extremely important issue for everybody in European Union. There is a lot of citizens which need better treatment concerning rare disease, better availability of drugs related to rare disease. So this meeting was extremely uh, fruitful and very important. In the meantime, a number of expert conferences took place under with the support of the Czech Presidency, and more will follow until the end of the years. There was involved a lot of experts from each European countries, a lot of great professors, doctors, speakers, and the conclusions was very important for future of health in European Union. But the series of experts meeting organized directly by Ministry of Health and with this conference dedicated to the very important and burning topic of vaccination. Vaccinations, vaccines, are one of the greatest advantages in medicine. Vaccines are safe. Vaccines are effective. Vaccines is pilot of modern treatment, of modern prevention of public health. Vaccination is uh, something like was during after war or during war sulfonamides, like was antibiotics. It is a really great success of modern medicine. And what we need to do, we need to support vaccination. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 was a problem concerning general situation around the vaccination. We have witnessed uh, the scope of the problem during the last two years of COVID-19 pandemic, which demonstrated the devastating impact of infectious disease to our health care systems, but also to our economic, to our, in some country, democracy and also the implication of questioning of evidence-based medicine leading to vaccines hesitancy, which underestimate an effective public health response. Stagnating vaccination rate, increasing reluctance to vaccinate could pose a major problem for the future public health challenges. And uh, perhaps I use two big words, but I have to use these words. The discussion concerning effectiveness of vaccination, it's discussion concerning effectiveness of modern medicine, of science, and discussion of democracy. These issues are closely related. And uh, this, this interpretation and the different information which you can find on uh, uh, web on Facebook and different uh, media. These are big problem concerning modern medicine. If we, we need to start to stop this disinformation. I hope this conference is very important concerning this point of view. Even though immunization programs are in the competence of member states, it's true reality. But I am deeply convinced that a more coordinated European Union approach be beneficial to prevent the spread of epidemics and vaccines preventable disease more effectively. I am absolutely sure now is time to closely cooperate and coordinate in European Union our health care strategy and health care politic. We need to have strong, powerful, European Union. We need to have strong, powerful European Union citizens, even if because there is a very aggressive war in Ukraine. And because of this situation in Europe, we need to cooperate, we need to coordinate, and healthcare, public health, 
and coordination concerning public health and health care systems is one of the key stones concerning the good and the best future for Europe. And I want to have strong, powerful future in Europe, not for me, I'm old, but for my child. And this is a reason why I support this cooperation and coordination. And this is a reason why I'm very happy that we have this conference. I am very grateful that we have met today to address mentioned challenges with a special focus on the role of communication in building vaccine acceptance, which also includes tackling misinformation. We will also further discussion the availability and development of new vaccines and explore progress in the digitalization of vaccination certificate, because certificate could be very useful concerning as a tool as a European health care pass or something like that. The conference will also touch in some aspect of the upcoming cancer conclusion on vaccination for EPSCO cancer in December, which support more coordinated European Union approach to preventing the spread of epidemics and addressing vaccine hesitancy. Let me conclude by saying I strongly believe that each thematic block will represent a good platform for a proactive discussion that will bring tangible results. I would like to thank all of you for taking your time to be here and give us the benefit of your knowledge. I know health is not economy. I know health is not energy. I know also that health is not money. But without health, there is no energy, there is no democracy, there are no money. So health is the most important what we have. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. That was Minister Valek, the Minister of Health of the Czech Republic and also the Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you very much. Now, as I believe, we have a pre-recorded message of uh, Commissioner Biera Jourova that she sent from Brussels. Dear participants, you have chosen a very important and timely subject to discuss. During each crisis, we are witnessing an increase of disinformation, false and misleading messages. We have seen it during the COVID-19 pandemic, and we are seeing it since the brutal and unjustified Russia's aggression on Ukraine. Of course, disinformation is not new, but the digital revolution has handed in new powerful tools to those who want to mislead us. It can spread faster and wider. This is why we decided to act on the European level. The digital Wild West, where disinformation can spread like a wildfire, must end. Our solution is European and truly democratic. It fully respects the freedom of speech. We have a mix of legislation, like the Digital Services Act and non-legislative initiatives. I am talking here in particular about our new anti-disinformation code with participation of all the big online platforms, advertising industry and civil society. The idea is that the platforms will become more accountable and responsible that we, the users, will regain more control over what we see, and that those who spread the disinformation do not gain money from it as easily as today. The first results of the new code should be visible early next year, and together with the Digital Services Act, it will change the digital information space in Europe. Of course, the COVID-19 pandemic reminded us of the importance of vaccination. It also reminded us that vaccination hesitancy is also a very real threat 
that can have very concrete consequences. We need to continue our efforts to increase vaccine confidence, which has been challenged by streams of disinformation and which affects people's ability to make informed decisions. Despite its proven benefits, vaccination is still subject to hesitancy. While it is hard to estimate precisely the scale of the problem, we can say that it has taken on industrial proportions with a range of actors looking to politicize vaccine hesitancy for their own goals, including also our adversaries focusing on the vulnerabilities of our society. To improve vaccine confidence, we have to limit the vulnerability, to build trust in institutions and experts. We have to show again the clear benefits of vaccines. The greater the trust in the democratic government, the healthcare system and professionals, the greater the vaccination acceptance and the lower the risk to be affected by disinformation. We have to invest in promoting health and media literacy and improving tools for people to protect themselves, to vaccinate from disinformation. Ladies and gentlemen, the fight against vaccine disinformation can save lives. It is not a matter of being left-wing or right-wing. It is a matter of caring about your family and your friends. We have used and continue to use COVID-19 vaccines as a crisis management measure which allows us to keep our societies open. And if the COVID-19 pandemic had a silver lining, it is that many member states developed new delivery models that make it easier for people to be vaccinated. People should not have to work to access health care. Health care should work for them. Offering vaccination in various locations and at convenient times, we must learn from this to increase the uptake of other vaccines. I am therefore delighted that the Czech Presidency decided to focus on vaccination and will put forward Council conclusions on the topic. This is a strong signal about the importance of vaccination as both a crisis and a public health measure. It is a strong signal of the political commitment to make sure that vaccination can happen. So, today's conference is one building block in a big construction work with one goal namely to increase the uptake of vaccination across the European Union. I wish everyone a successful event. Okay, those were words of Viera Jourova, the Commissioner for Values and Transparency of the European Commission. Now I would like to ask Ms. Andrea Amon, the director of the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. Okay, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you and uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues. Um, uh, ECDC has a vaccine and vaccination uptake since long time as a priority. This is why I'm so delighted that uh, Czech presidency has put this topic uh, on, uh, on, this, on this conference. Vaccines are very powerful tools. Uh, they prevent, reduce infection, severe disabling disease, um, some even reduce cancer or death. And you would think that people run for them yeah, um, it's not the case. And I give you an example with COVID-19, which is the most recent experience that we all had. Um, 
now we have around 73% of the total population with the primary course of this vaccine. So first, second dose. And this number since one year increased by a total of around 2%. Meaning in the last year, 2% of the total population of Europe have got this primary vaccination. Pretty disappointing. And then when you look, 55% around have a first booster. And for those that uh, the booster, uh, the second booster is recommended, the over 60, around 29% have that. So when we are talking about that we have to uh, increase the acceptance, we have of course talked to talk about uh, with those that uh, have not yet have their primary course, but also with the ones that we lost along the way with the boosters and the reasons why they dropped out or the others may not have um, uh, uh, vaccinated in the first place, may be very different. And um, so we are used with vaccinations mainly for the childhood vaccinations. And um, uh, now with COVID and lately also with the monkeypox, it's also uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the adult uh, that we say, well, we, we have to uh, create acceptance for the vaccine. Um, but when we look at uh, <clears throat> the childhood vaccination, uh, also there, uh, the, the, um, uh, the high uh, vaccination coverage rates that some countries have, um, are no reason for, for complacency in the sense, well, once a high coverage rate, always a high coverage rate. Um, so it's not an autopilot. We, also, we constantly have to um, uh, increase the uh, willingness to get vaccinated and for the parents, when we talk about childhood vaccinations, to get the children vaccinated. And we see, because, because and that's the reason for that is that the viruses and the bacteria are still out there. And we see this with the late, uh, latest uh, findings of polio in the sewage in Israel, in the uh, UK and in, in um, New York, or, or the increasing number of um, migrants that come with diphtheria from certain cases. So if we don't have a high coverage, these diseases come back. Um, now, when we <laughs> talk about trust, um, there are several reasons why the trust and the acceptance uh, can, be, can be low or, or decreased. In the ca case of COVID, um, uh, the, the aggravating factor was that it was a new disease. We didn't know um, uh, much about, even, I have to say, even about, uh, after three years, there are many things that we don't know. Um, so this scientific uncertainty fuels mis- and disinformation, which fuels low acceptance. There are other more mundane reasons with, uh, which, was, uh, 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 which were mentioned also by the commissioner with the logistics, but there are also some intrinsic reasons because sometimes people just don't like the messenger. And some people say uh, that I don't like when a politician uh, gives, gives uh, the message, especially if they don't trust the government. Um, some people don't like when a scientist is, uh, is giving the message because they don't like science. Um, and sometimes, you know, a football star gives, giving the same uh, message, saying the same words as I do, has a bigger impact. That doesn't help my ego, but it's important to know that, that, uh, that uh, um, uh, the, uh, the, sometimes the messenger is half of, 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 the, of, of the message. Now, we have to uh, have some good news. Well, some good news, but uh, uh, when we look at whom do people trust? It's the healthcare providers. Study after study after study has shown it's the healthcare providers, the doctors in general, but also the family doctors, the nurses. And they often also have questions. They are skeptical. 
So we have to address their questions, give them the opportunity to, to, to um, uh, uh, get, get enough information, and then train them for these sometimes sensitive, sometimes difficult discussions with their, with their uh, clients. So um, the other element that is good is risk communication and the first block in this afternoon will, will go more in detail to this. So risk communication informs people about uh, what they need to do, what uh, the risks are, um, and address also mis- and disinformation. So information is good, but engagement is even better. And that's one of the lessons, uh, the, the, the big lessons for me from uh, the, um, uh, the uh, COVID pandemic is that we uh, have to basically engage with the population, not when we just want them to do something, but on a continuous basis. And uh, um, with this community engagement that, uh, as I said, sometimes has different, different uh, uh, speak, spokespersons, um, that we can help uh, and build this trust. Um, uh, we can find out what are the reasons, what are the attitudes, what are, is the thinking in, in certain groups, and can address our campaigns accordingly. Um, <clears throat> so we have known about this since HIV. We have seen it in monkeypox, where, because without the contacts to the gay uh, 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 communities, we wouldn't have got anywhere. Uh, so you know, putting the information on the, on the uh, institute website or our website wouldn't help. So that is a very important uh, lesson that we, that we have to learn. So uh, I'm very happy that we have more time today to go into this also in more detail and I will come back to some of these things in, uh, in the next uh, session because we have to maintain the coverage. We have to really use these tools that uh, uh, we have uh, so that we don't slide back to a situation where people die of these diseases. And I'm really looking forward to have uh, these discussions uh, uh, with all of you this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So this was Ms. Andrea Amon, Director of the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. And now I would like to ask her colleague, Ms. Emma Cook, the Executive Director of the IMA, do you say IMA or IMEA? I wonder sometimes. <laughs> Which is the European Medicines Agency, right? Thank you. The floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you very much, and it's really a pleasure to be here. And um, I, I really thank the Czech Presidency for putting this important topic on the agenda. Uh, I was laughing with Jakob at the beginning saying this is the best and you kept the best to last, but I think it's probably the most important uh, topic and it's not going away. So let me just start on a very personal note. I was brought up in Ireland in the 1960s and I was vaccinated against smallpox, diphtheria, TBD, TB, we had a big problem in, in Ireland with TB um, in the previous generation. Measles and then as a, as a teenager, rubella. And these vaccines were game changers. Smallpox was eradicated as a global disease in 1980. And, now most, uh, and most of our citizens now take these public health achievements for granted. But it didn't happen by magic. It was the result of effective vaccines and vaccination strategies. And if we move forward to the present day, the vaccines that we authorized to combat COVID pandemic, we now have seven in circulation. They're, they, were all, they are also game changers. But not everybody got a vaccine, not because it wasn't offered to them, uh, but because they didn't want it. I cannot imagine my parents saying that they didn't want a vaccine for their children back in the 1960s. I just cannot imagine it. Um, but we've seen how things have changed and vaccine acceptance is a big public health concern and the COVID um, pandemic has brought this really into, into the spotlight and it's given us a much trickier communication landscape. 
it's a, it's a, it's a bigger crisis. There was evolving uh, epidemiological context. We had multiple waves of infections. We still do. There were, were increasing anxieties about the newness of the vaccines, the risks of side effects. There was widespread misinformation. And then, as Andrea has said, a lot of distrust and distrust in institutions. And vaccine, vaccination suddenly became a global conversation in societies, in households, in our communities, in our, in our schools. And what we know from history is that, and from science, is that a vaccine strategy only works as a public health tool when people get vaccinated in sufficient quantities. So if lots of people opt out of vaccination because of concerns or because of anti-vax narratives, uh, our chances of controlling a disease outbreak are greatly diminished. And this, this applies not just for COVID, but for all the childhood vaccines as well. So communication, communication is everything in public health, particularly in a crisis. And the reality is, I think we've seen that the traditional communication approaches don't always work. Um, let me just quote the expression, a lie will fly around the world while the truth is getting its boots on. So it's much quicker for false information to, to spread than, than uh, uh, good science-based information. So for every piece of good science-based information, there were a thousand pieces of false or, or misleading context. So what can we do to further help vaccine acceptance through communication? Well, from our perspective at the European a Agency, we have three things we need to think about. First of all, we have to make sure that we provide trusted science-based information. Secondly, we have to listen. We have to listen to what the concerns are. And thirdly, we need to make sure that our messages reach all audience wherever and whoever they are. We're responsible for evaluating new vaccines for the whole of the EU, and we play a role in, in increasing acceptance by building confidence in the science. We are an authoritative, reliable source of information for EU citizens, and we want science-based information to support those who are champions for vaccination in their community communities and this means that communication needs to be simple and it needs to be clear. Now our efforts on communication around vaccines began long before the pandemic. Uh, we, we already had a vaccine outre outreach strategy which, which was designed to increase knowledge and trust in the safety and effectiveness of vaccines but also to empower the EU public and healthcare professionals to take well-informed vaccination decisions. So we work together with the ECDC, the European Commission, uh, particularly the Health and Food, uh, and Food Safety GG, and, and we work together to develop the Vaccine Information Portal, which is a very important tool to bring scientific evidence around vaccination into one place. All the facts about the benefits and the risks are, are, the, are there, and it provides accurate, objective, and up-to-date information on vaccine safety and standards and vaccination in general. But the portal itself won't, won't overcome skepticism on its own. We have to listen and understand all vaccine concerns. When people express their concerns online to, about COVID vaccines, we used social listening to identify the genuine, um, the genuine questions that they had. And once we knew what those questions are, we, d we tried to put together some answers on how to address them. So we need to continually to analyze the concerns from a scientific and from a communication uh, uh, perspective, because sometimes the way we communicate is not reaching the right people. And the pandemic has clearly uh, shown us that even the most powerful messages have no weight if they don't reach uh, the intended audience through the, in, uh, through the appropriate uh, channels. So we learned this the hard way, I would say. We had to, uh, over the past two and a half years, we had to significantly increase our communication output um, at really short notice so that we could 
uh, have wider online decimation. We also have to boost our social media presence. presence. We, we built uh, connections with journalists because journalists uh, are powerful gatekeepers of information and we're very aware that it's our duty to be available and support the accurate reporting of vaccine safety. We also organised public stakeholder meetings and these were attended by several thousand people in, uh, and we, we had them live streamed and available on, on, on uh, YouTube. And these were great opportunities for us to listen to the needs and the concerns of our stakeholders and to reinforce public conf confidence in the COVID vaccines and in EMA's assessments. When we look at misinformation, we have to really see how to, cha how to challenge this information to more transparency in the processes and the work that we do as scientists. Uh, and it's very important for us that we explain the science behind our decisions, what we know, but also what we don't know. And we need to be open and honest and correct misunderstandings quickly when they arise. We are very transparent about our safety monitoring and our risk management, and we make all the, uh, all the information available to doctors and health authorities so that they can make the best decisions. Just remember, we were the first regulator in the world to put the results of clinical trials on products in the public domain, and we've kept publishing this, this data for COVID vaccines. Despite our best efforts, this mission is far from being accomplished. We definitely need to do more. We're seeing the impact of a polarized society and an increasingly diversified media landscape. And it isn't making our life easier, but I think it means that we have to try harder and think outside, uh, outside the box. We need to look at new ways of communication. What I say to my staff often is that, you know, we're not the best communicators as scientists. We need to think about how to simplify our message uh, and maybe lose some of the detail on the way. And we also make, need to make sure that we target the people who will influence others in the best way. And it, it, it's a new way of thinking for us as well. So in conclusion, I would say increasing vaccine acceptance is a long-term communication challenge and it requires increased and significant uh, resourcing. And it, we have to think about uh, how our organizations were set up because they weren't designed with this in mind. It's all of our responsibilities and we need to work together to plan, coordinate, and execute joint communications. Um, as a network, we need to have the right skills in place to be able to communicate in all directions, in all languages, to all people. And I think we, we saw that we missed something. Uh, Andrea referred to, to the, the doctors and healthcare professionals as being the key to vaccine uptake. We didn't target the healthcare professionals in the first instance. We did it a little bit later, and maybe we should have done that more. So our communication has to connect with the people wherever they are, and it needs to be timely, relevant, and accessible. And we need to make sure that the content is understood for, by people from all walks of life. If we can commit to this, I believe we can change attitudes through good commu communication to make, uh, we, can make, we can make sure that people make health uh, decisions that serve their own best interests, the interests of their family, and also the interests of society. And this will be in the interest of public health in the EU. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was Emma Cook, the executive director of the EMA, I will say. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the good news is that we are running slightly ahead of time, just a few minutes, but it's always good, I mean, to start a meeting when we are not, you know, lagging behind the time. We shall continue with, uh, uh, with the first kind of panel discussion that we are going to have about building vaccine acceptance through communication. 
Now, this is going to be a panel discussion in which all of you will take part and will be able to take part. I more than encourage, and I've been asked by the organizers to encourage, if you have any questions, I mean, after the first introductory remarks, you are more than welcome. Please ask questions or bring your own input into the discussion. This is not supposed to be a kind of stiff, controlled panel discussion. I mean, the more discussion there is, uh, the, the better. So, I would like to ask uh, the six participants, um, please come forward. First, Ms. Andrea Amon, okay, again. Then uh, I have Ms. Isabel de la Mata, Principal Advisor for Health and Crisis Management from DG Santé. Okay, thank you. Mr. Sergio Tomza from uh, UNICEF, Social and Behavior Change Specialists from the Regional Office for Europe and Central Asia. As you can see, we are kind of broadening the discussion. This is not just about the European Union. We are bringing in people from international community. Then there's Ms. Mia Contio, Chief Specialist from the Finnish Institute, but I believe she had a problem with the plane, uh, so she's not here. Maybe she will come later on. Then we have uh, Ms. Christine Moll Harbo, Deputy Director of the Danish Health Authority. I hope I didn't massacre the pronunciation. Harbo, is that okay? Fine. And then we have Ms. Sibylla Kilici. Again, I hope I didn't massacre Kilici. Okay. Director of Vaccines for Europe. Now, I suppose that if not all of you, then most of you will be familiar with the, uh, with the panelists. Um, I will actually try to grab the other microphone. You will be able to reach the microphone, I mean, once uh, it comes to you. Uh, maybe we could start informally. If you can just say a few sentences, how you got to your job, why do you do what you do, okay? Within one minute, if you may, please. <laughs> okay, so uh, I have been in the public health service all my life. I started at the local level, uh, in a local health department, then went to a federal state in Germany, to the, then to the National Public Health Institute, and then now I am at the European uh, Center for Disease Prevention and Control. And so I um, uh, know very well that uh, um, the, the situation, how it is at the local level, and uh, in Well, I did my homework and I did a little bit of research and I think it should be mentioned that you were one of the principal advisors to the German government during the SARS yes. epidemic and uh, influenza A H2N2, if I remember correctly, all right? So, broad experience, rich, rich experience and uh, very good biography. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, better. I've uh, been working with WHO and PAHO especially and other international organizations and then I came to the European Commission in 2008 and I have been in this post as principal advisor for health and crisis management since then. I'm a medical doctor uh, with a specialty in preventive medicine and public health. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Sergio Tomsa now. Yeah, thank you. I think I'm the outlier here. Um, I'm working with the UNICEF Regional Office for Europe and Central Asia and uh, my, as a social and behavior change specialist, I think I lost it, it's back, okay. Um, I work on quite a diversity of topics uh, beyond immunization, including education, uh, social inclusion, 
early childhood development, health nutrition. Immunization is a significant part of my work and our work uh, with UNICEF in, in Europe and Central Asia. It's one of the core priorities actually for, for us. And over the course of past five years, we have uh, developed quite a diversity of work streams when it comes to immunization, uh, strengthening confidence in vaccines, uh, including on social listening aspects, uh, engaging with health professionals, community engagement, um, diversifying the sources of information for, for caregivers and the general population when it comes to vaccines. So yeah, this is how I'm here. I'm with UNICEF uh, since 2008, uh, with the regional office since 2017. Um, and we are working with now 26 countries and territories in the region. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Christine, please. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm a medical doctor and a clinical pharmacologist, and I started uh, working with in the regulatory uh, part of it, and I have uh, been a CHNP member and member of Scientific Advice Working Party, and then during the pandemic, um, we also had the assessment of the new vaccines and development of vaccines. And it actually made me look a little up and say, um, what is the most important thing? And as the people here sitting, I think the public health perspective was something I was missing in the drug regulation. So I crossed the parking lot from the Danish Medicines Agency to the Danish Health Authority and is now uh, working with the Danish vaccination program, including the uh, enrollment of the COVID vaccines. So uh, drug um, medicines experts, but, but with a uh, love for public health. Thank you. Thank you. And now, Sibylia. So, um, I'm so Sibir Kwechi representing Vaccines Europe, which is representing the industry, the vaccine industry. Um, I'm a health economist and biostatistician by background, and I started as a consultant in health economics uh, in the UK, because at that time, well, it's kind of a long time ago now, um, health economists was not so developed to assess and to evaluate uh, medicines in general. So I went to the UK because they were much more advanced. So this is where I started and started working on uh, clinical trials data uh, based on my background. And I saw a lot of data, efficacy data, safety data, drugs and vaccines. And I was quite astonished about the public health value of vaccines uh, through the data from the efficacy, uh, the effectiveness, but it was efficacy data coming from the trials, but also the high level of safety that those vaccines uh, were actually uh, provided compared to, to other type of medicine. So I really decided to work in primary prevention and vaccine from that, uh, from that time. And after five years in the UK, I moved uh, back to France. I'm French uh, by nationality. Uh, working for the industry as a health economics expert and uh, trying to work on the guidelines, how you define the full value of vaccines and vaccination. And there was already issue at that time. I mean, we are back to, well, 15 years ago. Um, and, uh, and then realizing that despite my expertise, despite demonstrating the value through economic models, despite trying to define that vaccines brought broader values than medicines, for instance, and they need to have specific way to be evaluated, it was not going beyond the guidelines. It was not being heard by the policymakers. And this was uh, a willingness to move to the next stage with public policies and public affairs in order to, to bring this at a, at a different level. So from this industry, after spending 12 years in the industry, um, uh, as in a company more specifically, uh, I've been, uh, uh, since January 2021 actually, uh, I uh, joined Vaccines Europe, which is uh, leading the, uh, the old vaccine industry uh, companies operating in Europe. So representing the 15 companies. And the aim here is really to uh, build uh, resiliency uh, with regards to how vaccination can build a resiliency, a resilient environment, with really the aim to protect uh, the people across their life course, so at all stages of life. And uh, this is really, uh, for me, being present here to this conference is a, it's really an honor. I've been working through vaccines confidence issues uh, related to vaccination since 15 years now. 
I have been through the Italian presidency back to 2014, from which we still leverage actually the outcome because we had the Council conclusion at that time. We went through the European uh, recommendation on vaccination. We have the joint action on vaccination. A lot came out from uh, back to 2014, also demonstrating how complex the topic is because we are still dealing with the issue of vaccine hesitancy, but we are much more equipped with a better understanding today of what is at stake, so in a better position also to, to take the right actions to move forward. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you all. And uh, now, as I understand, I mean, each of you should make a few kind of introductions introductory remarks again, I mean, but more to the subject as we talked. And I believe two of you have got prepared short presentation materials, you two, right? Can we start with Andrea again, please? Okay. Yeah, thank you. This is the one that doesn't work. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, um, uh, I was also asked how uh, our new mandate um, that we, um, um, well, we're still waiting for the publication, but it's now agreed, um, how this helps, you, helps us uh, with the vaccine, um, uh, uh, raising the vaccine um, um, uh, confidence. Now, our new mandate gives us uh, a number of, of, of new tasks for, for surveillance, for preparedness, for EU reference laboratories, and um, uh, uh, so forth. But the most relevant for, for our topic here um, is the um, uh, provision that we should develop a framework for prevention of communicable diseases, including vaccination. And in this framework, um, uh, that is included health promotion, um, uh, education, health literacy, um, and behavior change. Um, in order to implement this framework, we have to scale up uh, our, our work and our cooperation with member states. And um, so how, how are we going to do this? Um, I want to give you an example. One year ago, I, um, uh, we looked at the vaccination coverage for, for, for COVID um, and we uh, uh, contacted 11 member states that had a vaccination coverage below the EU average. So we contacted them, the, uh, the directors and the national coordinators of the National Institute, they invited experts, and we listened. So we listened to them and said, well, what do you think are the reasons for these low vaccination coverage? And after we have listened to all 11 of them, we uh, found that there are specific issues for some countries, the GPs, the frontline vaccinators, the media, and there were issues covering all 11 countries. So for me, that was a very um, valuable uh, exercise to uh, target our, our, our efforts. Now, uh, the behavioral insights I have already mentioned. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, plenty of material now for, for um, uh, uh, recognizing uh, investigating reasons for, for low vaccine ac uh, acceptance, but also how to address mis- and disinformation, because uh, that's um, definitely uh, one of the major things that we, that we, that we saw. Uh, here we will develop um, further our social media listening, um, where we um, um, will uh, analyze social media and make these results of the analysis also available to member states, so that they also can, can uh, use the, the, the results for developing their own material. But in general, I think it's a part of this is also um, uh, raising the resilience of the population to resist, to, to, to uh, identify themselves what is mis- and disinformation, at least to a certain degree. So that is something with the health education that we also have to, to, to look at this. 
Community engagement, I have already mentioned, that is something that we, that we will look into and I will make this my personal goal when now the, the uh, preparedness plans are, are rewritten and reviewed, that the community engagement gets a, a, a special chapter in these, because if it's not in the preparedness plan, it will be forgotten. Um, uh, Emma has mentioned the uh, uh, European Vaccination Information Portal. We launched this in April 2020 in the middle of lockdowns and, uh, and it was completely under the radar. So we have now received <coughs> extra money from the Commission to, to actually promote the, um, the, um, uh, uh, the, the, this, this, this portal. And um, uh, we have now, uh, as an outcome of these uh, talks that I mentioned with the 11 countries, also a, uh, a workshop coming up in Romania uh, for a train the trainer for, for training and preparing um, uh, country uh, representatives to um, prepare healthcare um, uh, or health professionals um, to, to adapt and deliver these trainings for their country. Uh, because, um, uh, as I said, the, the healthcare providers, they are the most trusted, the most trusted uh, group for this, and we have to do what Ever we can to actually um, uh, well equip them for the for, for this task and support them in this. Um, we have a lot of online material, uh, e-learnings um, uh, that that uh, is available, and uh, we will listen uh, further to the countries and develop our material accordingly further. So. That I, I leave it there, uh, 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 there for the moment, and then the rest we can discuss. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ah, I see now we have uh, Mia Kontio, right? Yes. From Finland. So you arrived. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so let me uh, interrupt just briefly the uh, introductory remarks that you will you know, get your space. I asked each of the participants to say just a few sentences about himself or herself. Uh, if you may, you can grab the microphone, just say in, in your own words, rather than me introducing you, who you okay. are, why are you here? Thank you. Mia Conteo from Finland, and I'm, I'm not usually late, but this time I, I am. There's a strike in, in Helsinki, so um, I'm very happy to be here. So I'm in charge of the vaccination, national vaccination program. Um, in, in Finland, so just that it works and we get the vaccines. So uh, in that um, position, I've been also involved a lot with uh, the corona vaccinations and uh, with uh, Hanna Nohinek that most of you probably know uh, from vaccinations. With Hanna, the, the most uh, prominent phase of vaccinations in Finland now during the last two years. And I'm really happy to be here and, and talk about this vaccine hesitancy and ways of uh, keeping up the vaccine coverage or maybe getting it better as well. Thank you very much. Well, definitely welcome. Welcome in Prague. Welcome in the Czech Republic. So now I will give the floor to Isabel, please. Uh, thank you very much. So it's not the first time that we are here, uh, that we are discussing this issue of uh, acceptance of vaccination. And uh, in the pre in previous year, uh, we have been uh, also uh, trying to uh, in encourage and to increase the uptake of vaccination and increase the acceptance. And this has not been easy. It's not an easy task for the uh, professionals to, to communicate about that. And uh, in, in some way, we, we have in the population uh, vaccination fatigue. Um, uh, the European Commission has been working uh, since uh, 2018 mainly when the Council recommendations on strengthening uh, the uptake of uh, vaccination uh, was uh, well approved, um, uh, explaining the benefits of the, of the vaccines, uh, addressing the myth, the myth conception, etc. And, and also, um, we have been trying to pass the message that uh, uh, communication is important, but it's not the panacea for everything. We need to, uh, as uh, Emer could say before, to understand why people are not vaccinating, because it's something that didn't happen in the past. 
in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s, and, or in some countries, and now it's a problem, especially in, in Europe. So uh, the, there is also um, the, the trust in the national authorities, the uh, lack of convenience uh, of uh, the vaccination or lack of uh, access, or how the, the vaccine-preventable diseases are perceived by the population. Maybe they, are, they consider that they are not a, a threat anymore. Uh, and, and today, um, the Commission has published the um, uh, report on the, the state uh, of confidence on vaccination uh, 2022. Is the third one we published in 2018 and 2020. And uh, what uh, we have seen uh, is that um, for, in general, in the European Union, 81.5% of the respondents agree that the vaccines are important, 85.6% that the vaccines are effective, and 82.3% uh, that the vaccines are safe. So you can think that, uh, okay, it's okay. Uh, more than 80% of the population thinks that vaccines are useful. But uh, if we compare with the previous year, what we see is that in 2018, the, the numbers were not very high. They increased in 2020, but now for some of the variables, we are below that 2018. So uh, uh, thanks to um, the effort that was done by everybody, the member states, the, the commission, uh, the, the trust, uh, the confidence of, on the vaccine increased in the European Union population, but uh, now it's uh, back again. It's, it's not in the same way in all the countries, not for all the vaccines, not uh, for everybody, but, uh, but it still is uh, going back. And, uh, and another thing, this is for the general population, but what happened with the professionals, with the health professionals in general, uh, the, the trust on the vaccines is over 90%, but even this uh, over 90% means that there are 10% that don't trust the vaccines are safe, effective and, and useful. So that is quite uh, important. But for, uh, for example, for um, what they think about vaccinating against flu and against COVID uh, pregnant women, only 60% will recommend that. Uh, so we are we are doing a lot but maybe there is something that we are not still uh, going to the population i will not say that we are not doing adequately but there is something that is missing they're still missing um, uh, during this uh, last year, we have also seen uh, the, the important, I mean, uh, we have been submitted to uh, misinformation, disinformation, and uh, in, in ways that, uh, that uh, we haven't seen before. Um, we have seen that uh, something that is uh, interesting or uh, good uh, for the population is data visualization. So not only the message that we pass, but how we pass uh, that, that message. And um, we also so uh, we in the Commission think that it's important to involve the health professionals, that in, pr in principle they are the main source of uh, information for the health, uh, for, the, for the population in general. And this is why we ha have been working with the Coalition on Vaccination, that is a coalition of health professionals that uh, are um, working, I mean, in general with the population. And also how important it is to incorporate the behavioral uh, insights in how we communicate with the with with the population. We, as I said before, it's not only important to say that uh, it's important to vaccinate, but we need to investigate and, and to address why they are not vaccinating, even if they know that it's important to, uh, to vaccinate. Uh, so um, this, this is something that, uh, that we, ha we were working before the COVID-19 pandemic and we have reinforced during the, the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, we are working with the uh, ECDC and the EMA on, on this portal on vaccination and also to try to pass uh, coordinated messages. And uh, today is the day that, uh, I mean, just uh, to make that coincide with this conference that we published the report and also we, we have published in our website a campaign of United in Vaccination uh, with uh, several material uh, on vaccination in general and sp specifically also for flu, seasonal flu and for HPV. 
Um, other activities uh, in uh, two weeks or three weeks, uh, we will be launching uh, cartoons uh, addressed to um, teenagers, especially, and also at the beginning of the year will be um, e-training for um, teachers, teachers of uh, primary and secondary school, because uh, I mean they are. In, I mean the teenager is, is obvious; the children are uh, quite young, but in this uh, health literacy approach, uh, we think that the that the teenagers that they need to take care of their own uh, future, their own health, and, and also vaccination is important that they have material for them. And the teachers are in contact with the with the teenagers, but also with the uh, with the uh, parents of the primary uh, primary school children. So we think that they are obvious uh, population. I, I mean, all of that we are doing in cooperation with other commission services, and, and again with the ECDC and the EMA, and also all the the healthcare professionals that are working on the on the coalition. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. That was uh, Isabel de la Mata from DG Santé. And now I'd like to ask Sergio to bring in the uh, point of view, the perspective of UNICEF, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for the, the chance being with you here and uh, bringing our uh, you know, perspective over uh, vaccine hes hesitancy and strengthening confidence in immunization uh, based on our experience in, in working in the region. I mean, there are various models and, and theories uh, looking at uh, vaccine hesitancy and uh, demand for immunization. Um, most of them have quite a lot of elements in common. One of those elements is focusing on the individual, right? What the person thinks, knows, feels about immunization. Very often we tend to over-focus on this element. Uh, we believe that the person does not immunize the child or doesn't request the vaccine because of the a gap in knowledge or a negative attitude, right? So we tend to bombard the person with even more information even if that is not the cause. The person lives in an environment, we are not in isolation, and even if someone has a positive attitude towards vaccination, he or she may refuse or delay vaccination if the environment that he or she lives is not supportive of that. It can be the family members, it can be you know, the spouse, the mother-in-law, the community, the peer group. And understanding all these factors and addressing them comprehensively is uh, absolutely critical. Beside the individual's knowledge and attitudes and beliefs when it comes to immunization, there are also factors related to the availability and accessibility of services, of, of vaccines and immunization services. Again, very often we see that um, you know, there is a, a perception that if the vaccine is there and the services are there, those are accessible. We miss to understand the reality from the perspective of the user, of the beneficiary, and how they perceive themselves capable to access and utilize those services. And very often that, that is a gap. So without understanding the beneficiary perspective, just providing the services may be insufficient. And the last you know, group of, uh, of, of factors which influence um, hesitancy or affect demand for immunization, if I might say, it's issues related to service delivery itself. We have heard from parents across the region uh, through research supported by UNICEF that even when they are supportive of immunization, their experience with immunization services are not always the most pleasant one or positive one. Very often the health professionals tend to you know, use um, this top-down approach to communication to just tell the person what they need to do and to follow the medical advice without creating space for the person to ask questions, raise concerns, uh, get a little bit more information. So there is a missed opportunity to actually build that connection and strengthen trust not only in vaccines but also in the health system and the health service provider. So to build that, I mean, engaging with health professionals, and that was mentioned several times, is absolutely critical. And not only as a source of information, but someone who can have and maintain this communication with the patient. The patient is not the right word, but, but yeah, with the public. And to build that uh, self-efficacy of the health professionals 
and also to address their bias because very often we just heard it as well that uh, for some specific vaccines health professionals are hesitant themselves or they discourage people to take the vaccine we have developed as UNICEF a long time back with um, uh, John Hopkins Center for Communication Programs uh, a training package on interpersonal communication for immunization for health professionals that training package has been adopted and, and utilized in, in the region by many countries to really work on the uh, health professionals bias and build their confidence in vaccines but also their confidence in identifying understanding and addressing hesitancy which is absolutely critical um, another point that I wanted to and here just to, to, to uh, finish my, my thought around the health professionals I mean, training itself is is not always you know a, a solution we strongly believe that that has to be integrated into the in-service and pre-service training of health professionals so that it's not a one-time go but it's really part of their forming their development and they uh, truly believe in these uh, ways of engaging with the with the beneficiaries with the with people who are in front of them to listen and create that space for communication and dialogue social listening has been mentioned several times and we truly believe that to make communication meaningful and you know two ways and relevant we need to know what people are concerned about so social listening is a powerful tool uh, we have supported it uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic in 15 countries in the region uh, generating bi-weekly insights reports on, on these insights and many countries have used it immediately to, to communicate back to, to, to their population through uh, social media platforms which were underutilized by, by us in the past, uh, but also through traditional media where people are you know, taking information, uh, the talk shows, uh, and also by developing you know, job aids for, for health professionals, by developing uh, a list of uh, frequently asked questions and those myths uh, circulating in the digital space so that the hair healthcare workers are are confident and can address them them immediately uh, you know when when engaging with with people I will um, skip some of these things it's just too much but um, to just highlight a few more few more things and the, and the use of uh, behavioral insights because I think uh, I know, we have a lot of things that work for us and it's not only about communicating about the importance of vaccination but making vaccination services uh, easy um, and uh, you know acceptable by by everyone and to what we've also heard from uh, many caregivers they will sometimes um, feeling insecure to ask questions because they don't want to question the expertise of the health professionals and at the same time health professionals very often because of the time constraints and because they have so many other things to do they don't create that space for communication and they forget to give you know the the, the two minutes for for someone in front of them to ask questions and raise concerns so we have used behavioral insights with BIT uh, the behavioral insights team in UK to develop uh, different visual tools uh, in form of checklist that is on the on the desk of the health professional but also posters in the in the cabinets uh, encouraging caregivers to ask questions when it comes to immunization so it's just a, a small tool but uh, we are assessing the effectiveness of this intervention is, and if proven uh, effective we will uh, also you know, recommend it uh, to be scaled up uh, across the countries and another solution that we are testing in in Georgia not in EU um, is uh, connected to SMS reminders to, to help to caregivers on uh, HPV vaccination so uh, the families are receiving uh, a message informing them that there is an HPV vaccine available and waiting for them at the health facility and also providing some additional information on HPV because apparently that is a significant gap the solution is currently tested on 55,000 caregivers different you know ways of, of designing the message and again if proven effective it will be scaled up integrated as part of the national immunization system and applied also to other vaccines I will conclude by one point that again was mentioned before and I think it's absolutely critical we have to make sure that there are enough trusted and reliable sources of information and although we are building you know web pages official web pages with very verified uh, verified information and accurate information sometimes that is too technical we don't speak the language of people 
So we have to make sure that we are translating those things and diversifying the, the, the different sources uh, that people may, may get the information from. We are developing as in, with UNICEF at the regional office uh, a chatbot on routine immunization that will be available in several languages, hopefully by the end of the year or beginning of next year. But the strengthening the partnerships with uh, uh, media professionals so that they disseminate more positive stories on immunization uh, or they verify the information on immunization when they are publishing a story. Uh, but also with religious leaders, with uh, leaders from uh, ethnic minority groups, um, uh, community mediators is absolutely critical because sometimes the messenger is not trusted if it's an official one and people need to hear and want to hear this type of information from, pe from people they trust. Thank you. I hope I raised some valuable and interesting points and happy to provide more information if required. Thank you. So this was Mr. Sergiu Tomsa of the UNICEF. Now let me jump a little bit uh, to you. Uh, Mia Contio, uh, if you can bring in your perspective, as, as I believe you headed the vaccination process during the COVID-19 crisis in Finland, okay? What, what kind of lessons learned, what kind of most important new things that you didn't know before the crisis, you learned from that crisis? Well, I think um, about communication about vaccines, uh, the most important thing was that this time the whole process, process got personified. So there's a, somebody in the media who's very visual and, and everybody's listening to them. So you have one person telling these uh, things and it's, it's not a faceless authority as it is usually uh, when we talk about va vaccinations, uh, childhood vaccinations, we don't have a, a front person, a talk person that much. At least in Finland we didn't have any, anybody. It's, it's kind of more or less not faceless, but still it's not personified so that there's, there is a known person talking about the vaccines. And I think that's the, the, the biggest change that has been. So a lot, uh, was yeah, that was what was new. And, and, and it's, it's kind of dangerous if, if um, it, it turns out that this person is not somehow trusted. So it's a very touchy situation for this one put, to put on one person's shoulders the whole vaccination campaign, basically. Okay, thank you. Uh, would you like to add something? I mean, some more remarks because I don't want to cut. Well, short. yes, I, I had actually a PowerPoint presentation because, uh -huh. but I, I'm not sure if we'll be able to see that. Oh, yes, we are. Yeah, okay, thank you. So to. I'll, I'll you can use this bore uh, you a little bit, thing. but uh, and you can forward it from this, I guess. Yes. So just to talk about a little bit, um, I think Nordic countries are known for their, their high vaccination coverage and that we've succeeded in many things. And, and Christina has uh, even better uh, results from, from Denmark, I think, than Finland. Um, just uh, a, a few things that came up just uh, in, in the previous speeches as well. We're facing new um, challenges in a way that, uh, in Finland, we have a long country, so distances are, are long. And we kind of take it for, taken for granted that vaccinations are available and, and, and the services are available, but it's becoming more and more expensive. So for elderly people, for instance, uh, you can see in Finland, uh, the, the lightest color, there's less than 10 people per square kilometer, so not too many people there. And still you have to provide them with services. And it's, it's for schools as well. There are less and less schools around, so less and less school nurses as well. Less um, maternity clinics to provide vaccinations for children. So we're facing also these kind of uh, logistical problems in a way that services are further away from people and concentrated on these more populated areas. So it's, it's, it's not a small problem, I, 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 I'm, I'm guessing. Uh, growing cultural diversities, of course, um, I think you should think of it as an opportunity and not, not so much as a challenge, but it is a challenge because we have to be ready to, uh, to come out, out with our message in, in different languages, in different ways, to, through different people that we're not used to using uh, uh, because we've been very homogeneous Christian uh, country, so not many, uh, different leaders in there. Uh, but now we have to use these people and, and work with them to get up message true. So all in all, it, it's uh, a little bit different scenario in the future. 
Finns are very trusting of science and authorities. These are very re recent uh, surveys. Trust in science uh, and research, 85% trust, highly trust, or very much or quite a bit in science and research. I think it's very good, and only 2% that really little trust in science. Then again, the perception of, of science with some people maybe is not the same as our perception of science, but still. And the trust in authorities is very high as well. Healthcare workers, that was, as was mentioned, they are the ones uh, connecting with the people, talking with actual persons about vaccines and vaccinations. So in, in Scandinavia, I think that the trust in healthcare workers is very high, but we have to work on that to maintain it because that workforce is changing all the time as well. There are problems, there's a lack of healthcare personnel, uh, they're busy, so as mentioned, they don't have time for, the, for, for these people when they come and face them. Well, what really makes me happy is that the health experts are there quite high up, like my institute, uh, uh, THL in, in there, so 83%, and um, politicians a little bit lower, but still quite high for, for, I think, Europe, I guess, because it's almost 70%, so it's kind of a, um, well, surprising maybe. Uh, press and media are not so good, 40%, and social media influences, even if we, we talk about a lot nowadays about social media, how, how actually, what's the impact? Do people actually do what they see and listen so much about what they see in the social media? Maybe if this was done only with, with young people, the picture might be, might be uh, different. So trust is something you gain with, and it, it's not gained rapidly. So we have a long, long history of child and mother health care. Our maternity clinics just turned this year 100 years. So it started in 1922, and uh, to have these maternity clinics, and it expanded after World War II a lot. And if you think about Finland, uh, we're now like 5.5 million people, and then we were less, I, I can't remember how many, but still almost a thousand maternity clinics in the country and more than 3,000 branch clinics in the 1960s. And this is when, when there were um, a little bit less than 100,000 ch children born each year. So it's a huge amount. So they were everywhere. And that's why it was so successful because they were in every village. You could get uh, the services of the nurses. And if the village didn't have their own clinic, the nurses went there on a regular basis. And they knew the families, and they still do in small municipalities. In big cities, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but the nurses change. So it's not the same kind of relationship that used to be uh, in the old days, but they still have them in smaller places. The focus uh, changed from uh, only concerning mothers and children in the 2000s to the whole family. So, so fathers are encouraged to participate as much as mothers, of course, nowadays. And childhood vaccinations were a very integral part in this uh, whole uh, maternity clinic. Uh, and they are still, so one of the key issues. That's why I think the, the most important role in this has been the, the public health nurses in the maternity clinics. And they're highly trained and they, they're very knowledgeable. And this is what we have to support with the national uh, guidelines and, and um, all, all this support with how to face this hesitancy and everything. So we have a lot of material for, for them and this is just, I'm sorry to say it's not in English yet, yet the, the picture with the little girl. It's, it's our leaflet for parents which is in, in Finnish and English and it contains all the, the vaccines and explanations of diseases and vaccinations in the childhood vaccination program. And it's been very, very popular and hopefully we get get it out in different languages as well very soon. But the, the trust is still there. There was a recent study about the Finnish Somali community. Why is the MMR uh, vaccine uptake so high in Finland? It's because they trust the nurses. So the healthcare system in Finland takes into account the, the, the individual situation so well, hopefully for a long time, that, that uh, the uptake can be seen in, in different minority groups. But this is just an example. We have very, very wide um, uh, uh, web pages in our institute to support the professionals, webinars, everything uh, on a regular basis. Every month we have 
different webinars on different uh, vaccines. And those can be l uh, watched also afterwards. Um, what we're going to now is vaccination acceptance, more research informed, as was said, that we need to know why people are not getting vaccinated or why they are. And uh, I'm happy to say that our institute just launched this, uh, this uh, January, this Cultural Behavior and Media Insights Center. Sounds fancy, there's like two people in there, but they're doing a lot of collaboration internationally and nationally. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's good to be that this situation is noticed and, and we're working uh, for strengthening the knowledge uh, of how to um, develop activities and practices for the public health act activities. So this is one, just one uh, example of what they're doing. So Finnish science barometer and Finnish medicines barometer. So you can see that the vaccines are highly accepted in Finland, which is, not, and um, it said that in Europe, the, the kind of uh, hesitancy uh, against vaccine, hesitancies against vaccines is, is growing, but actually in Finland, we see that only about 1% of children under the age of three don't get vaccinated and it's, it's stayed constant for the last seven years. So I'm not worried yet, but it, we have to work on it to keep it that low. So communication changes and, uh, and we've been very good in, in, in a kind of traditional way of communicating, but it changes now during COVID times, uh, we went up uh, against them. We went uh, before the media every week, uh, the, Ministry of Social Health and, and Welfare uh, and, and our institute, every week we told them about the, the situation of the COVID pandemic and, and vaccinations. That's the traditional way, but, but younger people don't watch that. You know, it's, it's in the news, yes, and, and it's streamed, yes, but not so many people watch that. But then the figureheads like uh, our former head of department, Mika Salmin, and he gave, became the face of, of COVID basically. And a lot was on his shoulders and he did it well so that some people even took a removable tattoo of him on their arm so he was very liked but th this is just what was said that it's a very complex situation of what you have to think about when you start seeing what factors influence uh, a vaccine a decision to take vaccines so it's it's social media, yes, but it's everything we hear, everybody we meet, everybody we talk with, and, and our, our upbringing, everything. So it's, it's a complex situation, and, and what was said, that it's the environment that we're in, and you can't pinpoint one thing, basically, that, that is the most important. Um, the impact of COVID pandemic on trust in Finland, I'm happy to say that in science and research in general um, has significantly increased in, in many people's minds, uh, this, and we've been very vocal. The thing is that we have to nowadays defend our scientific view, which is not good. We noticed in the beginning of the pandemic that if you don't uh, come up with your message and, and tell it loudly, somebody else will. So the void is filled and it might be with professionals or experts that are not really experts on that field. So you have to be proactive and this is one big lesson as well. But um, I'm happy that the, the trust in has significantly decreased in authorities criticizing health authorities. So who is an authority? So lessons learned so far, I'm not sure we're there yet, but uh, I think main point is the communication must change with the target audience. We have to um, find new ways. We have to, social media is horrible because I'm not young anymore, at least not that young, that I know every platform that uh, the teenagers are looking at or it's difficult and you can't keep up with everything, but you, you have to be keep in mind who you're talking to. And I think one of the main point as well is to keep in contact with the nurses and the doctors giving vaccinations, keep them educated, answer their questions, keep them support, because they are the most important people in this. We can only do so much as government or national institute authorities. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mia. Uh, I already have quite a few questions, but I don't want to step into it. Uh, it was 
very interesting presentation, I believe, not just for me. Uh, let's go on uh, with, uh, I don't know, Christine, if you want to bring in the, the Danish experience, so to say. And you have a presentation as well, right? Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. And in many ways, um, the situation in our countries, I think, is, uh, is alike. But I, what I, I would like to uh, talk to you, uh, to talk about today, is this how um, vaccine acceptance through communication was, was built in, in Denmark and how, how to communicate was a very um, uh, active strategy and, uh, and not, not something that happened uh, by chance. And I'm standing on the shoulders of colleagues who has been working with this during, from the start of the pandemic. So please um, also send them uh, some, some good thoughts. Denmark, we are a little more Danes than the Finnish people, I expect. 5.8 million citizens and also uh, a homogeneous and, and, and happy, as I said in question marks, um, population, because I actually think the Finns, they won it the last time as the happiest people on, on, on the planet. Um, we have a very low level of income inequality, and, and maybe that's also um, uh, an, an issue here um, because of um, many of the issues you see worldwide also comes back to inequality. And maybe so that's maybe part of the success as well. And then we have free access to tax-funded healthcare, but also to schools and universities. So it's a highly um, educated uh, population. And there's a very high level of social trust. It goes back many uh, centuries, and I can explain to you during the coffee break why this is so. But, um, but also, a, a happy country like this can be, by, can be hit by, by, a, by a pandemic. Um, because also in, in our country, we saw hoarding with toilet paper and this car in the, in the front here is a, a little strange. It was a car driving around the streets in Denmark shouting out that vaccines didn't work and Corona didn't exist and so on. So it was very weird from, people thought it was more weird than, than actually informing, I guess. Um, Yes, and we also have demonstrations in the streets. So, so you can say, even though you have a high coverage and you, you have a high trust in the population, you will have some percentage of the population that is movable, and you have to p stay on your feet all the time to make sure that you that you keep the confidence and you keep the trust in the population, because. Trust is everything in how to handle a, a crisis like the COVID crisis. And as I said, there's a high level of trust in health authorities in Denmark, but it's also hard work to maintain this high trust in authorities. It doesn't come for free. But it was, I think, in many ways essential to get the country through the pandemic and also to ensure this, the high coverage rates that, that we have. Um, like all other countries, we have a lot of different authorities uh, involved in, in vaccinations. We have the Danish Medicines Agency uh, communicating about the regulatory issues, new vaccine uh, uh, approved, uh, some safety signals detected and, and, and so on. Um, and also uh, communication about how the vaccines work. And from my institute, the Danish Health Authority, we have the vaccination programs, the who and why and when, um, and we have the recommendations and the guidelines issued both for public and for healthcare professionals. And then you have the State and Serum Institute where you do the risk assessment and the disease surveillance, and you have the measurements of the vaccine coverage, the Ministry of Health taking care of the legislation, the political level, um, and then we have five regions doing the actual uh, administration of the vaccines and then the municipalities um, taking care of the vulnerable groups and, and, um, and groups with low uptake. So even in a small country there are a lot of um, authorities involved and one important lesson I think from the COVID is to be sure that these messages are coordinated, that, um, that we get a little tip from the Danish Medicines Agency that in a few days we expect the vaccine will be approved. So pl please be prepared for, for the questions and our communication strategy will be like this and then, then we have, can have our communication people uh, coordinating how to send this to, uh, how, how this will be uh, sent out to the public. Because I think careful coordination is important and to in, uh, have this um, unambiguity and not be, um, be, be 
be separated by either uh, questions of press or media. And I think that will promote trust in authorities. So how did we approach it in Denmark? The communication strategy was really that the health authority should be the go-to source. That this should be where you got the valid and correct information about vaccination. The public obviously knew disease, knew vaccine, knew everything, had a lot of questions where to go to. They should find the answers within the Danish health authority. Um, Another, the, you can say the first part of the study also was to be present and be available. And, and a lot of my points here, I, I have you heard before in, in Mia's presentation. Um, but it was important to be, to be present that you would go on all sorts of media. You could find the TV, radio, outdoor, social, so on, and be visible and be, this, the, uh, be visible in the public space so that uh, um, the, pub, the population could sort of get, get the information um, without too much uh, trouble or too much work. And to be active also, be active on social media, Facebook, Instagram, so on. Doing, I remember doing the HPV crisis we had in Denmark, there was big discussion, should we have a profile on Facebook, hmm, is that a good idea? And you can say during the COVID, I mean, th there was no question, we had to be where, where people are. Also be available, uh, I, you can see we also in the, I think they call it the, to be, make sure that we are on the, in the sofa programs, in the, in the nice, cozy television programs where you get your message through about the vaccination. Um, you have these Facebook Lives where uh, vaccination issues are being presented. And here in the corner, we have our director general uh, actually doing vaccinations out in a, in, in a mosque, I think, outside Copenhagen. Another thing is keep the message uh, simple. Um, I think you mentioned it, Emma Cook, about uh, sometimes you can dive into details and it's also almost strangling the experts if you, if you try to make a, a complex uh, um, message to, to simplify it. But it, it has to be somehow uh, easy, accessible and easy to understand to make sure that you, that you reach the, the public. And also make sure that you provide information to, to enable people to make an informed choice. Make sure that you don't push something in a direction where they feel that they are being pushed. That's at least in, 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 in my country, if, if somebody tells you you have to do something, you will run up doing the complete opposite. You have to have the feeling that you made your own informed um, uh, decision and own informed choice. And um, in the evaluations and in the um, guidelines, um, it, it was important to, it, really you aim to be trustworthy. So that's, I, I like the word because it's worthy of the trust that you really have to be open and clear about um, the process that you have done, the assessment of the material you got, how you came up to the decisions about which groups to vaccinate, which vaccines to use and to provide uh, not a single-eyed view, but have this a balanced, fair and transparent information. We have made all the assessments uh, publicly available and believe me, they have been scrutinized into uh, last uh, sentence and comma, but, but, but somehow you, you, you provide the information and the, that you actually uh, made the decision upon. So the strategy has been to make strong recommendations uh, in the contrast to other countries we don't have uh, could or should uh, recommendations. It's only uh, should uh, if, if we if you recommend a, 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 a vaccination. Um, we believe this is a strategy that make our recommendations uh, um, stronger um, for the public. And then to make um, data-driven decisions when data are available. It's not always been the. Uh, the, the case in the COVID pandemic, sometimes we had to make the decisions before we actually had the data, but make sure that you are clear in when are they sh decisions data driven and, and, and when are they based on, on some overall uh, assessment. And be rational. Um, my colleague Buleta said it all the time, if you can't explain it, you can't defend it. So you really have to have the story in the, in the recommendation that you know why you're ending up with this recommendation. And then, as I said, make everything uh, publicly available. Um, I just put in uh, this um, 
situation we had where the AstraZeneca vaccine was uh, withdrawn uh, and there was weekly measures about the public trust in, 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 in the authorities and it actually had what you would expect that, oh, you had to stop using a vaccine, that it would lower the trust in, in the authorities, but actually it strengthened because it was uh, transparent for the public what happened. Um, we have had great benefit out of these weekly data from the whole project that made uh, weekly um, assessments of public uh, behavior and trust. It was with questionnaires and people were asked different questions and, and the effort has been to trying to um, adapt the communication uh, in line with what was happening in the public. So give, provide real information for the public, uh, what they need and what, what they ask for. And also listen to worries and, and tendencies and try to address them uh, directly. Because as I, th I think as Mia, as you said, if, if, if you do not uh, tr try to answer a question, then somebody else will. And, and you're, you're not maybe sure you want, to, you want that to be um, the, uh, showing the, the, the headline of the day. Then I said data, 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 and, and more data. And, and uh, the communication department has been very uh, keen on using Google data to optimize the web page, make sure that, that the health authority would be the first um, uh, the search item you got if you if you googled some some word um, and of course is it manipulation I don't know I think this is um, the the world that we live in now that if you want your message to come through you also have to be present on these uh, in these medias this is very small I apologize to this but this is just to make that that the assessment of exposure not of vaccines but of of the communication how many viewers what are the demographic data of the viewers oh it's middle-aged women who are looking into this then maybe we should have a communication strategy for this week um, uh, um, addressing these and these issues we have now a, a question about um, the influenza vaccine uptake in children at the moment is not very high in Denmark. Maybe people are a little uh, fed up with vaccinating their children for the public health. We, we will need to address this with our communication. But we have actually been trying to be um, active on, on, on social media with this. And I was, I was asking myself, I haven't seen any information. But I mean, I don't have any children between two and six, so I'm not the target of the information. So the information will not come to me in my feed. So have a dam dynamic and adaptive communication has also been part of the strategy. And this is almost copy-paste of Mia, your slide. This is our Director General, uh, Søren Brostrøm, who has been the, one of the uh, spokespersons in, in the press and on the press conferences. And it's almost a legend now in Denmark how he wears uh, the mask. And, and in very elegantly, he used to be a surgeon, uh, can put on a mask so, so everybody is ready to faint. Um, and, and he was also used in, in some TV ads we had about, this was about how in, in making sure that young people stayed at home and, 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 and followed the restrictions when they had that. And this is, you can say, a benefit or risk that then you're a cover of uh, the most popular magazine in, for men in Denmark. So another point is it's important to, to respect people's doubts and fears and, 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 uh, and accept that no is also okay. It's also okay to, to not want an, a vaccine. And, and to uh, um, our, our communication partner said this, avoid this vaccine normativity so, so that you make having a vaccine the only option in the world. And do not participate in anti-vaccine sh uh, shaming that will, I think, for some people make you look like um, that you are just one of the boxers in a ring. And be open for the dialogue, dive into the debate, and also when they're not so, so comfortable, but be the authority that provides the facts. And I just put in here an example of uh, how we have tried to be very active on social media. Here's a citizen asking, what about the immune system? Why should they have a vaccine? And then uh, trying to address all of them with a, with a straight answer and, and coming through with your message. 
We have also used uh, influencers, um, uh, medical doctors from ethnic uh, groups, um, and, and, and making sure that, that you can say, you can sort of, you are leasing out your authority to people with, with high trust in other communities, and it has been very helpful. Um, uh, and I just have a few examples of trying com campaigns trying to address worries and myths. This was uh, the, the myths of infertility, and, and, and we had this um, uh, very uh, uh, nice and trustworthy uh, young doctor who was addressing this directly on Facebook. Um, so finally, um, build the acceptance is built on trust and authorities, and if you need stand-ins, make sure that they are um, adequately informed and, and, and uh, addressed for, for the job. Be worthy of the trust, so make strong recommendations, and we tried um, that so that we can both have them explained and understood by the public. And, and don't, don't leave anyone alone on the platform, meaning that you coordinate between authorities so that you don't play each other um, uh, out against each other. And acknowledge that there are different uh, views and provide, um, a, 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 you can say, balanced information, and then use data in your communication. And the final slide is just the campaign for this fall booster, saying in all the bus shills that if you look like this in high school, then we probably have a vaccine for you. I can tell you that the age limit is 50 years of age, so um, this made question this yeah thank you very much okay thank you very much Christine and now sorry Sibylia you had to wait for uh, for quite a while but I hope it was worth it okay. it was very interesting <laughs> so I have a presentation as well so I just do that so a presentation should be ready I think so I will yep. be quick there because th th there has been a lot being said uh, this morning about the value of vaccination. I think just not worthy that what we are fighting against today is that if you look at what is available routinely in national immunization programs or can be actually available through uh, national immunization programs is up to 20 vaccines preventable diseases that we can prevent. And uh, protecting the uptake uh, is, is really important. So 20, uh, 20 vaccines preventable diseases throughout life, meaning that it's not only about kids, it's adolescents and adults. And uh, we, we talked about already uh, vaccines preventable cancers, uh, which, uh, which is one of uh, an amazing achievement that we, we, we can have. And, and through vaccination, we can control, eliminate, and eradicate. We, can, we have already eradicated smallpox. It seems that people have forgotten about it. But we, we have uh, in the target polio uh, as next to eradicate. And there is really important elimination plan that, uh, so with measles, with uh, men meningitis, for instance, but also the uh, HPV-related cancers, for instance. So. Uh, incredible goals uh, that only can be achieved if we, if we manage to have high uh, uptake. And with regards to eradication, the, the, I think the, the, the most achievable things with regards to, to vaccines when it is possible, because all of this is dependent on, 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 the, on the root cause of, of infections and, and etc. But you can take it out of your national immunization programs and leave space to, uh, to, 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 to more vaccines. Um, Going back to uh, building vaccines confidence, I, I won't uh, repeat what has been said already and, and related to the decline of COVID-19, uh, um, of the trust in the, in the context of COVID-19. Something that I, I, I found interesting is that COVID-19 vaccination was really specific in the sense that it was really targeting adults. It's an adult vaccination strategy and this was really complicated for m many reasons. Uh, the infrastructure was not there, the, uh, the training of the health care providers were not uh, necessarily there, etc. So, um, something different from parental vaccine hesitancy. Uh, this is a, a different one to, uh, to tackle. And, uh, and the issue here is that the, the, the risk of spillover effect with regards to all the other routine immunizations that we have in, in the program. Um, something for me that is, is of critical and has been said across the presentation is the importance of data. Surveillance and monitoring of the uh, vaccination programs. Um, I can only acknowledge the incredible work that's been done 
by ECDC with regards to uh, the COVID-19 vaccines tracker. I mean, it was amazing to see uh, where things were at on a weekly basis. I can even not imagine how complex that was to collect those data uh, across the 27 uh, EU member states, but so important and so useful to know where you are at so that you can put in place the public health measures that are needed to, uh, to raise uptake. And, and the importance of such a tool for other vaccines and, and, and vaccination, because only when you know exactly where you are at, you can decide uh, what to do, or that you need to do something. Maybe the what is after, but at least that you need to do something. In the absence of data, you're just blind. You, don't, you just don't know uh, that you need to act. So this, for me, is really important. And related to confidence, more specifically, um, uh, Everyone has a role to play with regards to vaccines confidence. We heard about the role of the health authorities, uh, the role of the healthcare providers, the government, um, but I believe that the industry has also an important role to play here with regards to uh, the first, uh, our role is first to ensure that we provide qualitative vaccines with demonstrated safety and efficacy profiles. This is, I think, our first goal. Um, vaccines are one of the most complicated biological products to, uh, to research, develop, and manufacture. And very little uh, people know about this complexity. And our role potentially is also to communicate much more about the complexity. Who knows that uh, manufacturing lead time for most of the vaccines, and I put aside the mRNA technology and COVID-19 vaccines, but take years to manufacture. Uh, two years on average for measles vaccines, three years and even more for uh, multivalent vaccines like HPV or the, uh, um, uh, the pneumococcal vaccines, for instance. And throughout this manufacturing, long lead time, 70% of the time is dedicated to safety. Um, so quality testing and uh, uh, quality testing to ensure the safety. And across the life cycle of the vaccines from the moment it is uh, manufactured to the moment it's been uh, distributed to, uh, to, to, to the people, uh, safety, uh, quality control testing are happening along the way. And if there is any hiccups, the, the old batch of the vaccines are put in, uh, put in a bin and then you have to start again. So this is, this is something that uh, is, is really important. Pharmacovigilance, I mean, the, uh, the industry is, is really carrying out strict safety supervision of all the vaccines that are put on the market on, to, on a continuous basis to ensure that uh, whether it is really to detect, assess, understand, prevent uh, any potential side effects and potentially also communicate about possible side effects. And all those pharmacovigilance activities as well needs to be uh, potentially communicated. Something that we discussed very uh, little about but is because confidence is about confidence in the product, in the safety, in the efficacy, um, is, is what is for the citizens in case there is an issue with regards to adverse events. And what we've seen uh, during the, uh, the extraordinary circumstances of a pandemic is that in most of the member states today, if the citizens uh, have a side effect, the, the, the first route would say to go to, to court. Alors, the old liability issue with regards to the pharmaceutical industry, but the industry is liable. It's liable to, uh, for, for good manufacturing practices, it's liable to ensure the safety and the efficacy of the vaccines. But what if this has nothing to do with the quality of the product? What is left for the citizens? And in, in half of the country, most as half of the country uh, of the European Union, there is no, um, no fault compensation scheme to protect the citizens in that regard. So unless they have to go through long processes to court that is really costly or, or they don't have uh, uh, support. And many countries in the, in the context of the pandemic that did not have those no-fault compensation system put actually start working on the legislative route in order to have those to, 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 to protect better their citizens. It could be seen as if you need to, uh, to justify a compensation for side effects, this means that you're not trusting your, your products, but in fact it's, it's kind of a, a false belief. Uh, in fact, it's actually reassuring that there is a, a social contract here, everybody is taking his responsibility, the government is asking the population to vaccinate for themselves but for the others 
and therefore needs uh, the, the relevant protection if something won't happen. And, and, and there has been a lot of uh, studies from a legal standpoint uh, reassuring on this contribution to vaccines confidence. So as a, beyond the research and development uh, work that we do as an industry, what we do more on communication. Um, at, at Vaccines Europe, because the issue of vaccine hesitancy is not a new thing, and clearly not for, vaccine, for the vaccine industry, because this is a, a, an issue that been, we have been working for a long time. At Vaccines Europe, uh, we developed an online platform to discuss vaccines and vaccination targeting the lay public called Vaccines Today. Um, and Vaccines Today have uh, celebrated its 10 years anniversary last year, so, so you can see this is not a, a new thing. It's uh, back to 20, uh, 2011, actually, following the H1N1 um, uh, pandemic. And through this online platform, so what it does, it actually provides evidence-based information because it's uh, re uh, relying on the editor that is uh, publishing on vaccines today is relying on an independent in editorial board composed multi-stakeholder, uh, multi-stakeholders. So we have patients, patients representative, experts, um, civil society, youth as well, industry is part of it, uh, members of Vaccines Europe, but really to, uh, to, to provide information related to, uh, to, to infections and the way uh, vaccines work. And because of the request as well from, uh, from followers uh, related to understanding better how the, uh, the institution is working also on vaccine, etc., uh, the, uh, um, the editor has been uh, also interviewing the, uh, the, the institutions, whether it was the CDC, EMA, or the European Commission, so this is uh, a, a well-trusted sources of information that is supported by, by us, but in an independently manner. It uh, benefits from the WHO vaccine safety net as a gauge of quality, and um, and is quite uh, is working quite well. A second initiative that we have uh, is Vaccines for Life. It's a social media, media campaign that we, uh, we are doing um, with our sister association, IFPMA, so the International Federation of the Pharmaceutical uh, Associations, um, with the aim to communicate about uh, the value of vaccines across the life course, so uh, for healthy, healthy people, but also for pregnant women or for vulnerable population with chronic uh, disease or underlying condition. And uh, the, so it's, there is an iterative uh, process with regards to this social media campaign that is continued with a new theme on a, on a regular basis. And, and the one that was launched in September uh, a few months ago actually already reached 14 million of views. Uh, so, so fairly successful campaign, which is um, a, a follow-up, in fact, of the team vaccines campaign that we did during the, the pandemic in 2021 with the aim to, uh, to gather actually was a contribution of uh, um, individuals working in the industry talking about why it was so important for them to work on COVID-19 vaccines or therapeutics in, in terms of solution, what it means for them, uh, what it means for their families, actually to put a face behind who is developing the vaccines because um, we are also, uh, we are, yeah, I'm, I'm part of, of those people, whether it is in research and development or whether it is about uh, gaining the, the, the confidence and, and the willingness to, to have those vaccines used, is, is why do we do that as well as professional in this, uh, in this capacity. Uh, a, a third initiative that we, we are engaged on is a public-private partnership under IMI2 uh, called VITAL, which uh, aim at um, uh, working on vaccination for the elderly uh, in the context of healthy aging. Vaccination for the elderly is quite complex because of the immunosenescence of, of the population, but also in order to tackle how you actually communicate about the importance of this vaccination through the healthcare providers. So a lot of uh, training and, and communication happening through this platform, and also there will be a, a framework to, 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 to evaluate how to revise a vaccination scheme for the elderly based on data uh, that will be collected. Um, and the last but not the least is related to recent work that we've been doing. So as part of Vaccines Europe, the aim is also to understand 
to, to generate evidence, it's not to understand because we do understand, but to generate an evidence about the complexity of the environment that uh, we are in, and notably related to this, what we call the market access pathway for vaccines. So from actually uh, the post-marketing authorization from, uh, received from EMA, what is actually the pathway for the vaccines until they get to, to the citizens. So we've done a, 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 a significant study co uh, collecting data over the 27 member states plus the UK um, uh, about what is the process, how it works, and uh, we, the, the findings of the research is the, the actual decision-making pathway uh, is really, really complex, uh, is uh, not transparent. So going back to transparency with regards to the decision-making process, the need to understand how, uh, whether it is the NITAC, the National Immunization Technology Group, uh, Advocacy Groups, um, take the, the decision of the HTA bodies, how the, the decision to recommend the vaccine is taken, how it is uh, the decision to fund the vaccines is taken, and how to make this more transparent for the, for the citizen as well. Today, very few countries actually provide the level of transparency. Uh, there is a huge discrepancy across the region, and we believe that bringing more transparency in the decision-making process with regards to how vaccines integrate the national immunization programs will contribute to building trust and confidence. So just uh, to, to conclude, um, well, clearly we all have a role to play uh, in this complex environment. It's a really, really complex ecosystem. Um, I mean, regional for, for us being the, the EU, uh, more transparency at, at the national level. Um, the impact also at global, I mean, this is not only about us, it's also, it's, it's, it's in fact a, an issue globally. So it has to be, uh, to, 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 to be really, uh, I would say, holistic in the way we approach that. Uh, but I think we, we need to work all together. It's much, much, much too complex uh, to be worked out in silos. And I do defend the industry here to, to ensure that we have a place and a, a role to play here, uh, which I think is really important. And the last note, and I think it's been mentioned several times, but there is an issue with financing with regards to musician programs in Europe. I mean, 77% of the EU member states spend less than 0.5% on their immunization programs. This represents five euros per capita. And, and this is not working. This is not working because we don't have right now the infrastructure to cover uh, uh, vaccination uptake across the life course. We don't have the trained healthcare providers. Everybody is actually putting right now money on the table. I mean, the European Commission did a tremendous work in supporting really key initiatives at EU level, but the member states need also to, uh, to, 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 to have their role here and really assessing uh, how much needs to be, uh, to be, to be funded to really look at vaccination as an investment, primary prevention, I would say beyond vaccination, in fact, it's really primary prevention as an investment and not as a cost in order to ensure that what is necessary to, to be done to ensure the performance of the programs is well supported. I pause here. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. We still have just a couple of minutes. Uh, are there any questions from amongst you? Okay. Well, I believe there will be uh, a plenty more time and space for discussion in the uh, following panel discussions. Uh, now, what we are going to do, there's going to be a coffee break for about 15 minutes. Then uh, the organizers of, uh, of our meeting wisely decided that uh, the next two panel discussions, there will be two of them. One will be on the subject of uh, the role of primary care in communication. And the second uh, will be building vaccine acceptance. Uh, sorry, this was, it was this one. <laughs> uh, expert forum on tackling vaccine hesitancy, uh, which will take place in a Krakow room. You, will, you should be able to find it. And the organizers were wise enough to decide that these panel discussions will not be led by me here today, gone tomorrow, journalist by uh, trusted experts from the public health uh, area and, uh, and medicine. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, all of you, especially you, panelists, but you as well for your attention. Um, and I believe we will have the 
the opportunity to have many fruitful discussions during the coffee break and the following panel discussions. See you later, okay?
So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Maybe we can slowly start. Um, my name is Ludmila Bezdičková. I am a Czech family practitioner uh, working here in Prague, actually in this, directly in this area, and also a member of the board of the Czech Society of General Medicine and a teacher at the Institute for Postgraduate Medical Education. And today uh, I will be um, uh, organizing this uh, first panel discussion regarding the role of primary care in communication. I, I would like to remind you that there is another panel uh, discussion that's going on in uh, Hall Krakow, and it's uh, about the uh, EU expert forum on tackling vaccine hesitancy. So if you would be interested, you can also join the other panel session, but I'm happy for as many people as can stay here. Uh, we will be finishing at about 17.40, and then a short close-up, about 20 minutes, will be together with the panelists from the second group to make a conclusion on uh, what we uh, discussed in each panel. And after that, at uh, 19 o'clock, there will be a final gala dinner for everybody. Um, so just to begin, I'd like to invite the panelists up here to sit with me, if they are all present. Today, we will be having uh, um, Ms. Carly Reintam sharing the Estonian experience. Uh, she is the chief spe specialist from the Estonian Health Board. Hello, nice to meet you, and please sit down. Um, also, we will have the Sweden's outgoing uh, vaccine coordinator, Mr. Richard Bergström. Hello, you're welcome. Uh, we will have uh, Ms. Diana Costa um, sharing the Portugal's experience, the coordinator of the vaccination center uh, and uh, the director general for health, Portugal Ministry of Health. Uh, please welcome and come up here. Um, also, we host uh, Ms. Madalina Giorgetta Vessa, uh, the primary care perspective from the European Union of General Practitioners. Um, and we also have uh, the pharmacy perspective uh, and Ms. Uh, Mr. Jorge Batista from the pharmaceutical group of the European Union. Hello, nice to meet you. Um, from the vaccinologist's point of view, we will uh, discuss with Ms. Gret Hendricks. Uh, hello, nice to meet you, nice to have you. Uh, and last but not least, we will also share the patient's perspective from the uh, European Public Health Alliance view uh, and Ms. Rosa Castro. Nice to meet you and hello. Uh, I will shortly open the session and then I would like each of the speakers to present in a short presentation uh, the main ideas and the main views from each country. But I would like to spend the most time really discussing, so if you could please have the presentations focused on about five to ten minutes so we can really focus on discussion and on sharing our experiences. Um, I think we all agree that the prevention of infectious diseases is one of the major uh, points that we really need to um, focus on now. And the COVID pandemic has made that more than clear. Uh, traditionally, the, in the hands of uh, general practitioners, uh, the, the vaccination played a central role, mainly the vaccination of children. But in the recent years, and not only in the recent years, we started more and more focusing on adult vaccination as the world population is aging. And this is one of the main goals we have to uh, focus on in the future as well. And this is also the place where we can share our experiences uh, that we had during the COVID pandemics to maybe turn those into more positive and new goals to reach. Um, also, primary care not only involves general practitioners, it also involves pharmacists, nurses, in some countries, assistants, and also social workers. So in some countries, uh, pharmacists play a much more important role in vaccination, and we would also like to hear those experiences from the countries that already went in this direction, and maybe hear about the limits and about the uh, problems that, are, that the countries are facing. Um, GPs have traditionally been regarded as the most closest doctors to the patient, 
and so are the pharmacists in a way because uh, these are the places where the patients come the first and we have also a big role in sharing uh, literacy, health literacy in general but also vaccine literacy and this is something we should address more and more also in cooperation with media. So I would like now to um, ask uh, Ms. Carly Reintam to present her first speech and then we will discuss uh, from her perspective. Thank you. Oh, uh, everything works perfectly. Yes, uh, really glad to be here. My name is Kerli and I'm working as a C chief specialist in the Department of Communicable Diseases in the Republic of Estonia Health Board. And my background is mainly epidemiologist by training as well as a geneticist actually. But here I am combining those two fields now and I'm very happy to be here. So to talk a bit about Estonia's exper experience in uh, primary care, uh, I would like to give some uh, background information first. And yes, uh, I promise to be brief. Now I will try to use this. Perfect. So uh, to come to the very basics and talk a bit how Estonia how immunization in Estonia has been organized. Uh, family physicians, meaning GPs, uh, have had a central role in vaccination since the late 90s. Uh, before that, it was mainly carried out by pediatricians, especially when you talked about childhood vaccinations. But the late 90s and early 21st century saw many reforms. So the uh, accessibility to vaccinations was made sort of this one main spot for, uh, for all the people. Of course, during uh, school years, children also receive their vaccines in school by school nurses. But still, the family physician is the main contact point regarding all the vaccinations. Uh, this immunization is uh, settled in the Communicable Diseases Prevention and Control Act. And uh, Section 5 of Paragraph 8 also states the requirements for organizing this immunization in Estonia. One of those uh, very important uh, changes that came with the reforms in the early 21st century is uh, all the healthcare workers who are administering vaccines in Estonia are required to undergo a 16-hour training course and have an additional 8-hour training course every five years. So they get a specific certificate for that, that they have uh, finished this course. And uh, that is also why I'm bringing up this course, is because it is a very sort of important contact point to reach our healthcare workers who are administering vaccines and to reach them and uh, primary care uh, workers as well. So currently, uh, this is uh, here I have brought out the uh, base course. Uh, line out from the year 2021. As you can see, it is also consisting uh, of four mandatory modules. And it now, as of 2021, also uh, has a vaccinating against COVID-19 as part here. So uh, this uh, course is, uh, of course, uh, possible to be possible, open to change and open to different, uh, different uh, uh, global situations. And uh, of course, there we also talk about the general principles of immunization, as well as uh, administer administering vaccines in general, what could be the possible side effects, and how to consult the patients on the topic of vaccination and immunization, as well as how to treat side effects. So it's both a very practical as well as a communication-related uh, course. And uh, the healthcare workers can also choose additional modules based on uh, what are the more specific needs of that healthcare worker? For example, uh, vaccination against tuberculosis is part of the national immunization calendar, uh, but this is done in, uh, uh, after uh, birth uh, by midwives. So when a child is one year old, uh, one day old, uh, apologies. So this is mostly done in, uh, yeah, in hospitals, not by family physicians. But technically, they, it could also be administered by them. So yeah, based on their specialty, they could choose a bit. Uh, some more uh, statistics. Uh, in 2021, there were about 940 family physicians in Estonia. And each of the physician was uh, on average responsible for 1,417 patients. 
if you multiply it, that means it's uh, about 1.3 million people, which is uh, also almost the uh, amount of Estonia's population. So coverage, in a way, is not bad. And also our family physicians are supported by specially trained family nurses. So these are nurses who have specified in this family medicine. Uh, our family physicians in Estonia are trusted. Uh, we have, uh, for example, as part of uh, the WHO Tailoring Immunization Initiative, uh, carried out recently some focus group interviews, which showed that people uh, see team family physicians uh, as an important contact point and someone they could trust and they would in a way want more of that consultation from time to time but that is a person who who they can go to and also if we look at Estonia in general then uh, we have been a country with a high childhood vaccination coverage uh, up until uh, 2011 when we started to see a bit of a decline which is probably a challenge everywhere but still before COVID pandemic, this uh, coverage of most childhood vaccinations was around 90% to 93%. Although in 2011, we saw a 96% coverage. And uh, our challenges, as was already mentioned by some presenters from Finland and Denmark earlier, are also the rural areas, aging population, as well as the growing vaccine hesitancy. So yeah, these are the, this is the sort of the context and background that we have in Estonia. Now we go to COVID-19 and uh, in January 2021, we know that there was a bit of a deficiency in these COVID vaccines. So a specific plan uh, on how to give people the vaccines out, the vaccine rollout plan was developed and our family physicians had a central role in it, especially in reaching the risk groups and the elderly. And uh, our family physicians uh, contacted them separately by the age group. So they started from the, in their like fam, so each family physician has their own like a list of patients and they started contacting them even by name, names and separately. But this was all, of course uh, also supported by a general communication campaign uh, developed by the Minister of Social Affairs and the Health Board and etc. all the other most important institutions involved in this uh, plan. And, uh, and also reminders were sent via our uh, national health information system. Estonia is a very digitalized country and we have this uh, national central health information system where all of these health related data, data is gathered for every patient. So we went in with high hopes uh, for the COVID vaccination uh, campaign. Also side note, um, we Estonia when it had its uh, poliomyelitis vaccination campaign back in the end of 50s, early 60s, Estonia was one of the first regions to become polio free. And the last polio case we had in 1961. So how did we do with the COVID vaccination? So here we see the coverage of the first vaccination series against COVID-19 among people over the age 60, which means that this is our biggest risk group in a way or which our uh, National Immunoprophylactics Expert Committee teams as uh, risk group. These dark green counties, here you can see 15 different counties of Estonia, are counties which have now, as of last Monday, received the coverage of over 80% in that uh, population group. Not bad, could be better, but obviously we have some problem, problem child counties as well. And in this uh, small, one of the smaller countries there, uh, counties there, Hiu Island, uh, Hiu Magan, which you can see, even has this, uh, in this higher uh, and elderly uh, age group, uh, very high 91% vaccination. So why am I showing this here is this is a sort of uh, a part of our population who was uh, very personally approached to get vaccinated against COVID-19. Now we sort of go over to the rest. Uh, now next graphic, maybe I'm not as proud to show. But here we see the rest of the adult population from 18 to 59 and their current coverage against uh, COVID-19 vaccines. So any, any COVID-19 vaccine. And only one county has reached the coverage of over 80%. And there are even some counties where we see a 57% coverage. 
And the, this sort of uh, population was reached more by these uh, general communication campaigns, via social media, what we already, all of these methods were used that we saw in the previous block. And there it uh, remains a bit lower. Obviously, they are also not our, like, the most important risk group in a way, but it is still important to stop the spread of disease. Carly, just to ask, the first vaccination series, you mean the two dose? Yeah, two dose. Yeah. Yes, yes, we used two dose. Uh, a booster shot coverage is uh, about the 35% of Estonia's population have received a one booster dose. So that is more or less. And in the age group over 60, the uptake of this booster, first booster dose is a bit over 50, coming up to 60 on average. So not as high as it could be, considering that this is the population that could, could get it. But to very briefly now conclude, is that uh, family physicians, especially when we were approaching the COVID-19 vaccination, were crucial to, re to reach our risk groups. And they are, in general, trusted by their patients. It's just they also need support from us, uh, from, as well as from the government, from the ministry, from the corresponding health authorities, because we can't leave them alone in that. And uh, we need to keep motivating them, as well as uh, training a new generation of the family physicians. So that is very briefly from my side, and I am more than happy to elaborate later in our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Curly. Yeah, I would like to put at least two short questions now, because I think we forget if we leave all the questions to the end. So I would like to ask, because we had the opposite experience. We started vaccinating in large vaccinating centers, and the fear we had was how fast can we vaccinate? So my question to you is, how did you manage to vaccinate so fast in so little, in my eyes, so little general practitioners, uh, this population of high-risk people, and how many patients were you vaccinating? And also, what did the general practitioners do with the sick people uh, so how did they handle the rest of their normal work uh, in that um, in that light mm -hmm. hmm. uh, let me start from the very beginning yes these uh, bigger vaccination centers were introduced a bit later this like sports hall were turned into these uh, vaccination centers this is where most meaning myself as well also got my covid vaccine um, the cheap is mainly Mm. That is in a way a good question, but I guess uh, the rollout uh, plan was good. Uh, and we, we, as I also mentioned earlier, we started with very small groups, only like at first we targeted the elderly over the age of 80, then we also targeted the Im immunocompromised people, so we sort of uh, split it into these like tinier, tinier groups. So, so if I understand well, so the GPs vaccinated early the high-risk group of patients, yes. and then the rest uh, of the patients were high, also very uh, in high numbers vaccinated in large vaccination centers. Is that correct? Yes, but mostly the people over the age of 60 were uh, targeted by the general practitioners, and the rest of the adult population more in these bigger vaccination centers. Thank you very much. So that, that was different from our country, I have to say, and I'd like to hear some other experiences to that. What was the strategies in other countries? Do you have any comments? Okay, so if not, we'll leave them to the, to the end of the discussion, and I will invite uh, Mr. Rikat Bergström, uh, from Sweden to share a Swedish yes. experience? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, yes, I work for the Swedish government uh, for a bit more, uh, working directly for the cabinet uh, as vaccine coordinator. Now, it's, it's interesting with this map, by the way, there's another topic to be discussed uh, maybe at another meeting, is the regional variation in uptake or inter interest in different vaccines. Gytis, you're sitting in the back there. We had this conversation, interestingly, we actually reshuffled vaccine doses in Europe because in some parts of Europe, the people only wanted mRNA vaccines. In other parts of Europe, they wanted adeno uh, vector vaccines. Really interesting to study later on. So first, uh, a couple of uh, declaration of interest from, from my side. I was one of the negotiators for uh, the EU. I was uh, part of the joint negotiation team. Um, so guilty as charged for buying all these vaccine doses. 
uh, whether you think there are too many or these new variant vaccines we have now, whether they're good or not, you know, you can uh, come after me afterwards. Uh, so I've been part of that. Uh, second, I'm a pharmacist by training, so I have a certain bias uh, that I think pharmacists, pharmacies and pharmacists could be used much more. Uh, and the third uh, declaration is that I'm actually leaving this job in a few weeks' time to go to a company called IQVIA, which is in, in between sort of private and public. But nevertheless, um, I, I suppose therefore also I can, I can say what I want to say. Uh, we, I remember we had... Uh, I don't know if Jakob, if you were there, but under the Slovenian presidency, there was a, a big conference and they had a slide on with the Slovenian proverb that said the following, always speak truth, then leave room immediately. Okay, so I'm not, but I'm not going to leave the room immediately, but, but I'll give you a few perspectives on this. So I was actually not in charge of the organizing vaccinations in Sweden, you know, but, but we, we didn't use pharmacies. Uh, we predominantly used vaccination centers that were set up in the beginning. And af after that, we've actually used primary care centers for, for reserving and mostly online, which was a bit of a problem in the beginning to get that organized, but it's, it worked sort of fairly well, okay? So I must declare that I was in charge of buying vaccines for Sweden, not organizing the, the distribution. But I, I was invited to this conference, I suppose, because being one of those who actually ordered all these vaccines, what are my reflections on, on how, how it worked and it, it didn't work, okay? Uh, so there I would like to say, and I'd like to build on, uh, Andrea talked about this in her um, presentation uh, earlier on, you know, and it came back from our Danish and Finnish colleagues as well, the fact that somehow, you know, this initial mass vaccination, if we call it that, we, we, in Sweden we always avoided to use that term, uh, because it's, it gave sort of the wrong connotation that everybody has to line up and it was still a degree of, of voluntariness, you know. Uh, I was always, when I was on, on media a lot, I was always clear on that. Uh, but still, we did it that way. There was, you know, huge centers. And, and at one, uh, one period, you remember, end of May, June 2021, we received like one million doses a week to be, to, to be used. So it was quite high throughput. No, so we had special centers for that. Uh, but, but I would like to build on previous comments today is that, you know, so Sweden has around almost now 11 million people. And if you exclude the, the younger, and we're actually not that active with vaccinating children in, in Sweden, and that's another topic, you know, with cultural differences between the US and, and, and Europe, particularly Northern Europe. Uh, but we have 7.7 .7 million people that have taken two doses. Okay, so they're not against vaccines, okay? But only 5.5 .5 of those have taken a third dose. So that's, that's interesting. You know, why is that, Andrea, you, you, you touched upon that. I mean, forget about the rest, sorry, to be blunt. Those that don't want to get vaccinated, you know, they're superheroes, they feel invincible, whatever, you know, whatever, forget about them. These other people, why haven't they taken the dose? And I have even colleagues in the Ministry of Health in Sweden and others and journalists that I speak to, you know, they say, oh, why haven't you taken your third dose? Oh, well, I haven't come around to it. It's a question of convenience. Well, it's a question of two things. One is clarity in communication. And I actually do think, and I, do thi I think we need to talk about these vaccines as three dose vaccine. It's a three dose vaccine, EMER, message to regulators. It's a three-dose vaccine. Now, we, why, it went very quickly, this development. We didn't have time, we didn't, industry and the public, we didn't have time to optimize the knowledge around the sequencing. Usually you do that, you know it's, it's, it's three months in between or six months, whatever. That was the only shortcut. The shortcut was not on efficacy nor on safety, particularly not on safety, but we didn't know enough in the beginning. So I think we need to say it's a three-dose vaccine. And I think that's one reason why we have failed to reach the high levels for the third dose is partly communication, but it's also convenience, right? Because we dismantled these huge centers, which made it very complicated. I mean, how do I get that dose? And that's where I think that we need to learn from those countries that have used pharmacies. And in fact, I have to declare that I've taken two doses in the United States saved some money maybe for, for taxpayers in, in Europe because I didn't pay for them at CVS. 
as a pharmacist, giving this dose. I mean, I would never inject anybody. I'm a pharmacist, but I was never trained. But they were trained. And, and this convenience of, of just popping in and, and, and taking that dose. So when we have moved from this large-scale mass vaccination situation, and you're looking at uh, you know, more, more voluntary, it's risk groups, it's elderly, it's others that feel motivated, we need to rethink the way we, we use our resources. And the pharmacies are there. I mean, you already pay the rent, <laughs> you can say. And as long as you don't bring in more people, it's not going to cost you much more. It's very, very small incremental cost for actually carrying through the, the vaccinations. So I, I do think, again, pharmacists are biased, but I think that going forward, when we move into some kind of more normality of regularity in this, with more voluntary you know, boosting, uh, I think we should really uh, deploy all the frontline health workers we have, not only doctors and nurses, but also ph pharmacies and pharmacists done too little, we sh you should have employed more uh, primary care physicians and pharmacists in vaccination? But I'm not sure in the beginning, I think we, we, we mobilized everybody we had, I think, you know, as a, from a Swedish perspective, I think it worked, it worked very well. I mean, we had people very frustrated, they were angry with me and others in the beginning because it was so slow, AstraZeneca couldn't deliver, Janssen didn't come, where are the doses, the, the tents were there, they, uh, empty airports were there to vaccinate people, right? So I, I think that's not the problem. I think the problem is, has been later on. That 2.2 million people, Delta, that did not take the third dose, that's where I'm, that those are the ones I would focus on. And there I think, you know, we need to look at different uh, routines, basically. Uh, drop in Sundays, why can't you vaccine, get vaccinated on a Sunday? Or uh, while you do go shopping, you take a dose. We even had vaccination centers in the shopping malls. <laughs> and it worked. But uh, my question also is, do you think the education of the, of the vaccinators plays a role? Because I, I have a fear that maybe it, with the third and fourth dose, part of the hesitancy is due to the fact that many physicians even uh, are not sure about the importance of following doses. No. And th then it is very hard to explain the population something the physicians no, even it, don't trust. No, but there, and there may be colleagues in the audience that disagree with me, but this is where I think that it's not only the convenience, it's also clarity in communication. It's a three-dose vaccine, you know, for everybody, and, and, and maybe a four or the fifth dose for, for certain groups. And if you're not clear on that, if you're iffy-wiffy on TV and so on, say, oh, I don't know, I had Omicron twice, and that's probably going to be enough. I mean, I think the evidence is there that a, a standardized vaccine dose is much better than having a so-called natural infection. So I think clarity and communication is as important as the, uh, the, the convenience. Now, as I still have the mic, uh, I want to reflect on something that was said earlier by the colleagues from Denmark and Finland on communication. This thing that you need to be out there in the media all the time. I, I think that was so strong. That was a, from, from the previous session, that was the strongest take home message to me. You cannot leave a void in communication. It's a Saturday, it's a Sunday, the, 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 the social media or the evening press, they're going to write something. You need to be there. You need to be available. Because if you're not there, they'll make something up. So I think that was really, really, really strong. Clarity in communication and then it's about convenience. Do you think also there's something about explaining the changing of the knowledge we had? How, how, how well we can explain the things that changed no, well, that's, an, that's a very good question. I was on TV very early in Sweden, and I, I, said, I said the following. I said, you need to be prepared for the fact that things will change, recommendations will change, because we will get new knowledge. And guess what? <laughs> I was proven right. You know, AstraZeneca was first recommended, let's see now, only below 55, and then only above 65, and then not at all. You know, what was that based on? It was not, it's not like regulators are, you know, w flowing with the wind and changing their minds. It's new data, new knowledge. So I, I, think, I think that's a big part of this is that you, and I hope the entire population has been somehow educated with the fact that you have experts that can say, I don't know. You'll be on TV and say, I don't know. It's actually a strength. Yeah, but you might not think that, but I, but I think there's, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, um, as they say, there's a lot of research, research that can be done 
on communication. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions from the public for Ricard? So if not, uh, I would ask uh, uh, Ms. Diana Costa to share the experience from Portugal, please. Good afternoon for everyone. I am here uh, because we were invited to talk about uh, the Portuguese experience in COVID-19 vaccination. And I am also with my colleague, Dr. Teresa Fernandes. Um, and uh, I will start uh, the, the vaccine, the, this presentation with uh, sharing the, our agenda. Um, first of all, Portugal has achieved all the targets set in Europe uh, for COVID-19 vaccination and in Portugal we went beyond these targets and we achieved very high level of vaccination coverage. We show so, uh, here uh, some numbers, 98% uh, of the adult population completed the primary vaccination schedule and 99% of the population 65 years and older received the first booster. This uh, graphic, uh, we can see the vaccination coverage uh, by age group and the number of doses administered. Uh, the impact of these achievements was seen very soon after the start of the vaccination campaign. Uh, already in March 2021, uh, we have seen a step decline uh, in terms of hospitalization in general and in ICU and also in terms of mortality rates. Uh, but this success was also a consequence of a board uh, articulation between the different health institutions and also uh, the institutions from the different, different sectors through a value chain that consists of sorry, vaccine procurement, vaccination strategy and recommendations, uh, recruitment and booking, distribution, vaccination, and also monitoring. A COVID-19 task force was put in place to promote inter-institutional cooperation and to plan, monitor logistics operations. Uh, the Directorate General of Health, with the support of the COVID-19 NITAG, assured high quality vaccination uh, and safety through a rapidly evolving evidence-based strategies and recommendations. We highlight three essential parts of this process a COVID-19 dedicated NITEC, a vaccination strategy against, first of all, severe disease and mortality, and secondly, uh, also against infection, and a comprehensive nationwide guidance with webinars for health care professionals. Several practice uh, standards have been issued in order to guide health professionals and to provide the best guidance based on the best available scientific information considering WHO SAGE recommendations, ECDC technical reports and EMA summary of product characteristics. Other key uh, success uh, factors in the implementation of the campaign were the target communication campaigns, the centralized vaccination registry and management platform called Vaccinash, uh, mass vaccination centers, ca call for vaccination uh, by SMES, telephone, self-scheduling platforms, and open house strategy. This is uh, an example uh, of uh, a, a COVID-19 vaccination center. Uh, these centers were mostly uh, big sports halls, uh, but concert halls uh, were also used. Uh, and uh, good accessibility was an important point. And first there was an admission and delivery of a questionnaire according uh, to, 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 to national guidelines. And people required uh, to indicate any contraindications and um, they were informed by health professionals about uh, the advantages of uh, vaccination and after that they get uh, the, the, schedule, the, the scheduling of the next dose, um, the next vaccine administration. There is always a clinician in a vaccination center to support their activities. 
Uh, we also conduct some studies to evaluate uh, the int intentions of COVID-19 vaccination adherence in Portuguese population. And another example was the social mobilization project developed by General, Director General of Health in order to train micro-influencers to be able to pass on relevant information and empower the community in different settings. The key points of the training mentioned above include introduction about COVID-19, COVID-19 vaccination, uh, communication strategies, and we provide a toolkit with some digital materials uh, of communication and information to be used on this matter. Sorry. Uh, director, the Directorate General of Health has identified trusted members of communities, from firefighters to municipality uh, leaders, to inform and motivate people to comply with the changing COVID-19 protection measures and vaccination. Since May 2020, over 5,000 5, micro-influencers have been trained. Here uh, is an example of a pharmacist, Luis Lorenz, who participated in this project, and this is a testimony uh, as advertised by WHO Europe in August 2022. After uh, other uh, key factor is after a guidance uh, publication, we develop uh, some strategies to disseminate information to health professionals and citizens. For example, by asking our experts to talk on national, te national television programs, by distributing flyers with information about vaccines to health professionals and citizens, and providing training to healthcare professionals. These are some examples of a communication campaign for target populations such, such, such as people with immunosuppression, pregnant, and for parents uh, of young children. But uh, the success of the COVID-19 vaccination campaign is the result of a legacy left over from several years of the national uh, vaccination program. And in October 2022, we celebrate uh, the 57 years of the national vaccination program uh, with main principles of this program. Uh, Har, who, the, the, he is universal for free, accessible, recommended, equitable. Also, we should take all uh, vaccination opportunities. The impact of our national vaccination program um, between these years is one disease uh, eradicated, six eliminated, and seven controlled. Um, but uh, this success in the years of the pandemic um, is a result uh, of the beginning uh, we, uh, when the first lockdown was implemented in March 2020, we carried out a campaign with the objective of alerting to the importance of national vaccination program. And this is a, an example of our uh, communication materials. The awareness, awareness of the importance of vaccination at the beginning of the pandemic and the vaccination culture led Portugal to continue, continue to have very high vaccination coverage through the pandemic. Here we show some vaccination coverage for some vaccines of uh, national vaccination program in the last three years for different age groups. Um, it is also important to highlight the importance of the experience acquired uh, with the influenza campaigns in the last years. In the 2020, local health un units and municipalities started partnerships to use new sites for flu vaccination uh, to facilitate vaccination of many people in a short period of time. Local pharmacies uh, started to link to the central vaccination registry, vac vaccines before the pandemic. Now they are all uh, sell, sending their uh, registries to vaccines automatically. Uh, participation of the pharmacies in the national flu vaccination campaign for free started in 2021. And now vaccination centers are used for both COVID-19 and flu vaccination. Sorry. I think that is not working at all. Okay. As a final message, uh, we would like to cite our former COVID-19 coordinator, Walter Fonseca, to whom we wish to thank for all the dedication and urge 
work done during 2021 and 2022. We honor the past, we escalate cooperation, and we innovate through dig digitalization. We keep trust from the community through transparent decisions based on the best available evidence to each moment. And a, a, a sentence uh, that uh, was uh, said here today, uh, but uh, our Directorate General of Health uh, has mentioned this sentence too. Uh, in Portuguese, vacina para a vida, uh, and in English, vaccines for life. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I have to say it was very impressive. The numbers are impressive and the organization is impressive and it's very inspiring for most of us, I think. Uh, I have one question that is very, ac very active here now in the Czech Republic. How did the general practitioners take losing part of the role as the only vaccinators uh, before the pandemics and maybe in the past and passing this to the pharmacists as well and to maybe other uh, the vaccination centers etc uh, did the communication go well all the time or were there some problems some hesitations also from the patients maybe not being sure if vaccinating themselves in the pharmacy is okay or not uh, Okay, thank you. Um, the, the general physicians, uh, they, are, uh, they have a central role in vaccination and um, in the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, as uh, you said, as she said before, uh, they, um, uh, they have a, 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 a good uh, practice in the reaching uh, risk groups vaccination and uh, um, the personal approach and consultation uh, is very imp uh, important uh, for, uh, for people and GPs has uh, a very important role uh, to, 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 to communicate for the importance of vaccination to uh, the patients and to to, to give them um, a, a certain uh, information about uh, how vaccines are important and uh, the importance of vaccination. Okay, so it sounds it went uh, smoothly, <laughs> the organization. Yeah, yeah. Since, yes, they um, was a part of the organization by identifying the risk groups, as I said before, they have a role uh, in all uh, COVID-19 campaign and uh, um, I, th I think they, they will continue uh, this uh, collaboration and this, uh, uh, and, and this role in the vaccination in the future. I don't know if my colleague Teresa Fernandes uh, needs to, to, to addition something for this answer. No? Uh, I, I just want to add, Diana was, was uh, was as you said what uh, what we have the the clinical the general practitioners are have uh, also their role in vaccination but uh, in fact it is um, it is uh, the role of several uh, professionals that work towards uh, a good vaccination coverage in fact uh, 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 for the national uh, vaccination program what we had on vac on covid-19 vaccination is a kind of um, a bigger approach to, for the same model more or less the same model of the vaccination program gps and pediatricians advise uh, people to get vaccinated but then they are vaccinated in uh, in their health centers without a consultation the, 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 um, the physicians are not the ones who vaccinate. Uh, in general, uh, nurses are vaccinating without uh, the need of scheduling any, any consultation. So the free access, we believe it's, it's, it's an important factor. It's just to add that, that uh, we don't need, um, uh, uh, the physicians are not the ones who vaccinate. 
So they have the role of communicating and advising parents and, and also uh, adults for vaccination. That's, that's the main role. And um, so um, pharmacists also have uh, their role, uh, 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 gradually a bigger uh, role in vaccination. Uh, as, as Diana presented, they started to have uh, um, to cooperate with the, with the Ministry of Health in vaccination, mostly uh, in, um, before uh, the pandemic, they already vaccinated in private market, but their registries, we started to, to make a pilot for the registers they did to uh, link uh, immediately to the, the, the national, uh, the centralized registry uh, system. Uh, and now we, uh, after, now with the pandemic, they all, uh, when they vaccinate, all the registries are, are linked to, to our system and we, we, so, so that we can monitor uh, better uh, vaccination. Uh, they work most, uh, mostly, mostly not. Uh, um, the partnership with the Ministry of Health is, is now for, uh, just for influenza vaccination and in 2021, as, as it was prevent, presented, they, they started um, they started vaccinating also for free for the ministry. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you very much. It's very inspiring. Observation, and maybe it's more of a com comment than a question. I noted, having worked on all the reshuffling of moving doses in Europe, that I, I, I clearly saw an effect on, 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 because of lack of tourism. There's an economic effect. I saw that very clearly. You saw Greece, I didn't expect such high vaccination rates in Greece. We saw an uptick in Spain and, and Portugal, big time, at the time when people realized there would be no tourists this summer. I, I don't know if you want to comment on that, but I, 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 I think that's also worthy of some research, is the fact that when those that are not really against vaccination, but, oh, should I, when they realize that the whole economy is basically collapsing, because of you know lack of, of, of these of these uh, visitors, I think that had an impact. Do you, do you agree? Did it, did, it, did it contribute to the will? You know, clarity in the communication, a strategy from the government, but then also this insight in the in population about what this means for the country. Do you agree? In the, the pandemic situation, we did uh, some studies about um, the intention to vaccination to COVID-19 vaccination, and the results w were uh, positive. Um, and uh, our vaccine uh, acceptance uh, is high, higher uh, than the, mo the, the mostly um, uh, countries in Europe. I, I don't know, I don't know the, the answer for, the, the direct answer for your question, but I think that uh, the vaccine exigency is a topic that we need to work in the future and we need to understand much better uh, what is uh, the, the, the reasons uh, for this hesitancy uh, and how, how we could uh, have better results um, uh, in vaccination, uh, understanding these, these reasons. Uh, I think that is a thing that all the countries uh, need uh, to, imp to, to improve and to work uh, in the future. I don't know if my colleague... Okay, thanks. Cultural and uh, uh, national differences also uh, just caused by the different uh, mentalities and so on. So it, some of the factors may not be transplantable into different countries. Something may work in one country, it may not work in, in the other. So we have to also realize that and maybe some, some concepts we can, we can learn from each other, but some others maybe we cannot. Uh, any other questions? Yes? Yes, Sergio Iavicoli, Italy. Uh, um, Portugal have been always performing uh, very at a, a top level in terms of vaccination rates, but also in confidence, including the, the report that was uh, uh, mentioned before and was just re, uh, released by the EU Commission. So these results, I mean, you know, I heard the debate 
I, 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 we, we analyze also at national level the, the Portugal case uh, and uh, the general practitioner strong role in the country how it's organized seems to be very, very effective because you have a person to talk directly and you are used to from uh, when you are a, a child in your family setting. So that's where you build the trust. So I don't know if, what do you think about this? Uh, uh, and uh, also what you do to support your practitioner in terms of communicating and facing the challenges of misinformation uh, that uh, are complicating the scenario. Thank you. I will try to answer um, the question. Um, in Portugal, uh, I think, as I said, we have a legacy um, from our national vaccination program um, that uh, has 57 years and it's a lot of time of vaccination culture uh, in Portugal and uh, we have some principles um, in PNV, uh, has uh, the, name, the name of the program in Portugal, that um, his, the accessibility uh, it is for free um, and uh, I, th I think that th this, this, this fact, this culture uh, is uh, the principal reason um, in Portugal for our coverage. Um, for, for our pr pr practitioners we uh, gave, um, uh, we gave uh, some materials, uh, some trainings, uh, for example uh, our guidance in COVID-19 vaccination has uh, the advice published online uh, for access to everyone and uh, I think that uh, we, we are also in contact uh, with uh, our practitioners by um, uh, our, uh, because we, we have uh, regional representatives that are in contact uh, with, with them and with the locals and I think that this information um, can pass to, to everyone because we, we are um, in contact uh, at all the time. But I don't know if my colleague Teresa Fernandes needs to, to, to add something about this topic. Okay. Was this uh, net developed already before the pandemics, like uh, the, the, the cooperation? Network. No, 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 before the pandemics. It's uh, since the, 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 the program, the, vac the, the national vaccination program was created. I think the, the cooperation was, was uh, constructed after that. And nowadays uh, we are all in contact uh, in country with regional uh, um, representatives with local representatives and with the uh, GPs uh, with with this uh, hierarchy uh, I think or this flu uh, this information uh, yeah. okay thank you very much also very inspiring thank now it w I would like to ask uh, Ms. Madalina Jorge Tavesa to present her experience um, and she'll be talking from the point of the European Union of general practitioners please Hello, on behalf of WEMO uh, President Kalimbo Bulutz, I want to uh, thank you for this invitation. And for those who didn't heard till now about WEMO, WEMO is an organization of the most representative national independent organization representing general practitioner family doctors in countries in Romania. In every general assembly, we have dedicated time for working groups one of them is preventive activities and uh, the main subject is the vaccination. We don't have any um, general assembly that we don't uh, have an hour at least to talk about this topic. For the last GA, uh, what uh, happened uh, two weeks ago, uh, we prepared a survey regarding vaccination process across UEMO countries. I didn't want to uh, talk here about my perspective because I'm subjective, I'm a family doctor in Romania, uh, 
so I uh, make this survey to tell you the voice, to hear the voice of UEMO members. Uh, with yellow are all the countries uh, who is in UEMO. We have 10, 23 responses, two countries respond twice, so we have 21 countries who respond on this survey from uh, 25 members. One of the questions was uh, where child is vaccinating, wh where the children are vaccinating. Uh, six countries said that only in GP practice they uh, are vaccinated in UK, Ireland, Sweden, Portugal, Romania and Turkey. Uh, ten countries said that on GP practice and other facility, and five countries said uh, they don't vaccinate in GP practice. What means other facility is vaccination center, pediatrician, pharmacies, community health center, school, a special preventive service for children. I ask also uh, who work in this vaccination center, who, who is uh, the specialist, the response is also the GP or the family doctors. Only Serbia is the only country that the GP is not involved at all. The children are vaccinated only on pediatricians. Uh, where uh, are vaccinated the adults? Uh, five countries said that only on GP practice. 15 countries said on GP practice and other facility and one country said no GP practice. Other facility is the same vaccination center, hospital, pharmacy, community health center, other specialty. Uh, also, I ask uh, Finland, uh, who's, uh, who respond uh, that uh, they don't vaccinate adults on GP practice, uh, what kind of doctors, what specialty have uh, the doctors from vaccination center, and they respond that also are GP. So we can say that the GP, the family doctor, are very involved in this process. Um, in your country, do you have mandatory vaccination? 600 uh, countries uh, respond with yes. Malta, Serbia, Croatia, Slovenia, France, and Italy. I put also the response of my colleague from Turkey because uh, for my point of view it was uh, interesting. There is not mandated, but vaccination rate are about 96%. It's a huge coverage uh, from uh, Turkey's uh, side. But also um, I, I, I um, uh, watched what happened in Portugal and was very surprised about how the coverage was uh, uh, on every month, it was higher and higher. In the case of patients or family members who refuse, uh, who refuse vaccination, are there specific intervention by the state or medical staff, such as counseling the hesitant person about vaccination? Eight countries respond with yes. I put some uh, responses uh, from my colleagues. Concealing by a doctor and signature of the medical intervention refusal form, the GP is encouraged to conceal. The preventive service do regular follow-up during childhood and meet the parents regularly. Methods of the getting people to change their mind are soft. You have to call parents for consultation for this issue, and if they refuse to come or keep the same attitude, you have to contact inspection Ministry of Health for Future Measures, Croatia. And other country, uh, the children uh, uh, can go, uh, uh, couldn't go on a kindergarten or school without uh, this vaccination. Regarding to the concealing activity, in order to increase the confidence in vaccination, there are individual or group concealing techniques impl uh, implemented in the primary care. This country respond with yes. But uh, when I, uh, when we, I ask uh, what kind of techniques, they don't tell us. The response was uh, uh, that when it comes to other vaccine panels are organized with, where health workers and media celebrity talk to citizens. Uh, all you give a consistent message, uh, um, mostly individual counseling, so it's not something very um, specific, most of all, uh, they respond that it's uh, con uh, counseling face-to-face. -face. Is GP 
or family practitioner involved in this process, 12 countries respond with yes. They usually choose to ask their GP. Um, over 80% of the entire COVID vaccination program has been delivered by the GP uh, family med uh, doctors that is approaching 200 million vaccines. GP has a role of concealing about every vaccine. GP play a key role in encouraging vaccination uptake, uh, uptake in Ireland and so on. The most important challenges in your country related to the vaccina vaccination process on the top is the anti-vaccine movement. In my country, is, it's really the, uh, the big problem with uh, this anti-vaccine movement because on media um, are only these people who speak in television public or uh, social media and or uh, so on. The second place is GP lack of time for counseling hesitant people. Also, we, um, in uh, our working group, uh, said that with these COVID problems, we, do, we have less and less time to uh, talk with our patient because we have uh, to manage so many things. And um, also this uh, part to communicate with our patient, it's, um, it's lack of time, actually. The, on the third um, place, the method of packing some vaccine in multi-dose vials, uh, it's about the COVID vaccine. Lack of vaccine, in my country we don't have in this moment a uh, hexavalent vaccine, for example, and low uh, confidence on healthcare workers in vaccination. I want very, I, I am very pleased to uh, tell you that in Romania, on last week, we start uh, with uh, a course about motivation interview. Uh, it's a project founded by uh, UNICEF Romania, organized by National Society of Family Doctors in Romania. Uh, the course is based on a program founded by CDC and UNICEF uh, two years ago. And uh, now we start um, for family doctors to improve um, their skills to communicate, but unfortunately is not addressed for all the family doctors from Romania. Uh, uh, they are only, I don't know, three or 400 uh, 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 doctors who is involved in this uh, course, and we are uh, 10,000 family doctors in Romania. So the conclusion on General Assembly is, was that the GP is the main vac vaccinator in Europe. But we have a team or we are single because uh, some of uh, countries, they have um, a big support of, of the um, political or I don't know, health minister and uh, other countries, they don't have this support and uh, sometimes I feel in my office alone with my patient and uh, just what I transmit to my patient, uh, my patient, um, um, they, my patient don't heard about vaccination in social media, on TV, on other stuff, to, to be trustful, to trust in vaccine. So, if you have a team, that means that it is political strategy, also on the uh, short times, uh, sh uh, short time or long times, and also it's very important that medical framework send the same message. It's a problem that some of us, doctors or nurses, we don't tell the patient the same message. One of them, uh, we, well, one of them are anti-vaccine. But what's happened if you are single? It's very clear that we have a low coverage. Well, that was, I want to, uh, um, to present um, the idea of uh, our uh, members. 
not myself because I speak a lot. I, I'm very involved in this uh, vaccination in vaccination uh, movement, and uh, uh, I'm a trainee, trainer, train, trainer in my country, and I'm very involved uh, in vaccinations. But I want to uh, s uh, to show you the the. Um, what WEMO members said about uh, vaccination. Thank you very much. We are already missing some time, but I still have to ask one question that I'm interested in. Are there any EU documents for GPs as a guideline how to communicate with patients on vaccination or? I ask, uh, uh, this, uh, I ask uh, this uh, on my colleagues and uh, from their response, they, they don't have or they don't give them about uh, um, about uh, a good uh, vaccination uh, in Romania. Now we start with some kids with a motivational interview. We learn about this, uh, but um, uh, other members don't mention about something like that. It's a consoling face to face, and they don't uh, follow something. Uh, um, a guide or a document. Also, but more question: What do you do with the uh, practitioners who don't support vaccination or don't trust vaccination enough? Do you have any programs how to convince the GPs who are against vaccination? No, unfortunately, in Romania we don't have uh, some programs. Uh, unfortunately, uh, every doctor uh, who are against the vaccine is very popular on <laughs> social media. Um, I saw to another country is that um, uh, a doctor, if he's an anti-vaccine, uh, they uh, remove their um, practice. They can't uh, practice anymore if uh, he is an pub a public uh, anti-vaccine. Thank you. Anybody wants to? comment on that? So if not, I'll pass the uh, microphone to um, Mr. Jorge Batista, who is going to speak from the pharmaceutical group of the European Union from the pharmaceutical point. Exactly. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for staying to the last bit of this meeting. I'll just be presenting the perspective of community pharmacy in vaccination. So um, I'm speaking on behalf of PGU, the Pharmacist Group of the European Union that represents pharmacists, community pharmacies in 32 different countries. We are represented through the professional associations and also the pharmacists association. So we represent over 400,000 community pharmacists and uh, more than 160,000 community pharmacies that every year receive more than 46 million of patients that go through their doors in Europe. So bring you some uh, small numbers. I will not go through all of them, but you have the slides and then have, at the end of the session you can go through them. But 58% of uh, the patients can reach their New Year's community pharmacy on foot in under five minutes, which means that community pharmacies are really at the core of the communities. And this number increases to 98% if we understand that people can reach their New Year's community pharmacy on foot in less than 30 minutes, so really at the, at the heart of the communities. We also see that community pharmacists have been developed their profession. In the 15th century, we used to see the apothecaries um, making the medicines and then these throughout the years, fast forward five centuries and you see that pharmacies are taking more clinical roles. And then eventually they'll go into the service provision and here concretely I'll be talking about um, the vaccination in community pharmacies by pharmacists. So despite having or not the power to vaccinate, pharmacies contribute to uh, vaccination in different areas. So in four big groups, first of all, identifying and reminding target groups, for example, um, patients with 55 years or older, chronic patients, they also remind um, um, citizens of their travel medication, they also can advise on children, they remind for patients using the integrated uh, electronic health records and pharmacy software, so the electronic solutions that we have, and also they register and consult vaccination status through the electronic health records. Some countries have it, some countries are still developing on that. 
I here bring a, a perspective of 32 countries, so they go a bit beyond the remit of the 27th of the European Union. But then again, we have different practices according also to different regional legislations. Pharmacists also provide information and advice, and here we saw already, um, and Ramon already said that healthcare professionals are the first source and the, the, the most trusted source of information for patients. And, and uh, community pharmacies provide evidence-based and balanced and balanced information on the, on the benefits of vaccination and also the vaccination schedules. They also complement information uh, of physicians and other healthcare professionals. So here, really, we see that community pharmacies work in tandem and within a network of GPs. And also, they um, use information as a prevention approach. We have uh, heard this today, um, that the, the prevention is the beginning of the investment in healthcare. So if you invest more in prevention, you then reduce uh, costs on treatment. Pharmacies are also able to pr provide uh, awareness raising and advocacy campaigns. So. As we, as we saw before, community pharmacies are really close to the, to the patients, really close to the communities, and we can use this network to spread information that is evidence-based, that is unbiased, and that is really trustworthy for the patients. They also participate in own initiatives and also several national and EU campaigns. And we saw also in some countries that were able to vaccinate against COVID-19, the immense word of um, uh, vaccination campaigns that we saw and posters, outlets, media. So it was really enforcing uh, vaccination for the population. And of course, they are visible. They are uh, um, uh, really visible part of the, to the society. There are also some countries that have vaccines that can, can be administered in community pharmacies by other pharmacies or other healthcare professionals, for example, nurses, and they also improve convenience and access to all parts of the population. Pharmacists, when they are available to vaccinate in community pharmacy, they need to go through certified training programs. So here is really also the focus on continuous professional development that pharmacies need to go through to be able to acquire this extra skill. I here bring uh, just a, a list of countries that uh, already um, vaccinate against influenza. And uh, the, the criteria to be put on, the, the, on, on this map is to have uh, this power granted to pharmacies in legislation without a temporary, um, uh, a temporary period. So we saw that, for example, in certain countries, specifically with COVID-19, pharmacies were granted temporarily uh, powers to vaccinate against COVID-19, and then after a certain period, it was revoked. So if that period does not exist, if it is, if it is enshrined in law, then they make it to the map. And we see already that 11 countries can, can vaccinate against influenza. In COVID-19, we see a little different change on the map. Some countries got in, some countries did not choose to, to vaccinate um, on, on COVID, against COVID-19 through community pharmacies. But we saw that overall, uh, with regards to vaccination, we have 13 countries, 11 of the European Union plus two uh, out of the European Union. In this case, it's uh, Switzerland and the United Kingdom. So, but 13 countries in the Europe region that are able to vaccinate uh, in community pharmacies. Um, a small uh, red dot to pinpoint the countries that have also decided to go through um, more than influenza and COVID, and for example, introduce shingles, HPV, meningococcal, pneumococcal uh, vaccination in community pharmacies. We saw some pilots also happening in other countries. For example, uh, Sweden had it, Estonia had it. Uh, they did not make it to the, to the chart yet, but we hope that in, a, in, a, in the next uh, years to come and, and months to come, they will be making, making on the map. I was also asked to speak about uh, some uh, pilot projects and, and um, examples of the member states. For example, Ireland, approximately 50% of the community pharmacies provide uh, vaccination services, and uh, currently they account for over 16% of flu vaccinations. And since the community pharmacies started to vaccinate against flu, um, so in, back in 2011, the delivery has increased by uh, circa 60%, and GP flu vaccine delivery has also increased by 27%. So here we see already that pharmacies are not uh, um, vaccinating the same people as in GPs. They are rather um, reaching other fringes of the population that were 
using to go to the doctor, for example, to have their vaccine. So they go to the community pharmacy, they actually go there to pick their medication or to someone that is ill, and they also see a sign, okay, maybe I can get vaccinated this year. Yes, it, it's easier to go to the doctor, so I'll just do it here for a matter of convenience. So we see that we are actually targeting different fringes of the population, which I think is an argument that is really useful to clear out. So here we see also that, um, for example, in Ireland, uh, decided to increase other vaccines, for example, pneumococcal and herpes zoster. And we see that throughout the years, uh, the numbers are a bit small, but you can see them after, they have been increasing throughout the years. France, for example, in 2017, there was a law that allowed pharmacists to conduct a pilot project on vaccination against seasonal influenza. Fast forward the year after, and this pilot was launched in two other regions, and more than uh, half of the pharmacies actually participated. So the year after, the pilot was further extended, enlarged the population, and from March, 1st of March 2019, all pharmacies in all of uh, the territory of France were allowed to vaccinate. The pharmacies would need to go through a complete training program, both theoretical and practical, and it also needs to have a private consultation space in pharmacy. And I would say that these are two key milestones for every and any vaccination program delivered by pharmacists in a pharmacy. So pharmacists need to go through training, theoretical and practical, and there needs to be enough conditions and enough space in a pharmacy to, uh, to conduct, conduce these vaccinations. So uh, in the 2019-2020 uh, seasonal flu campaign, one in out of four people got vaccinated in the pharmacy. And um, in, in the case of COVID-19 vaccination in January of this year, around 60% of uh, um, vaccinations were uh, given in pharmacies. Also with a high uh, um, satisfaction rate. So UK, England, we just bring here uh, short news. Um, that basically what it says at 65%, over 65% of patients um, of uh, 65 years or older have been vaccinated in community pharmacies. Again, this really specific fringe of the population that we know that has been in every uh, ECDC and, and WHO recommendations to have them vaccinated. It, it, we, were, we managed to reach out and also um, it was also understand that the, the, the rate would increase. And finally, 99% of patients would like to have their vaccination uh, again at the pharmacy. Portugal, I would not go through details because my colleague uh, Diana um, has uh, already uh, showcased, but I'll just, just a, a few points. For, for 15 years that uh, Portuguese pharmacies can vaccinate in community pharmacy, um, 2018 pilot, it was a bit different. Why? Because there was no need for prescription. It was the first time that people can go to the pharmacy and they didn't have a need for a prescription. There was no, prescri uh, no administration uh, charge, so no fee, and also, it showed that uh, in a specific pilot project, this uh, model was able to increase around 32% of the, vaccine, uh, the vaccination coverage rate. In the flu vaccination campaign in 2020, um, there was a small, a, a different model. So a pharmacy received a 10% of stock of the whole National Health Service. As you, uh, as you know, um, community pharmacies are uh, uh, private, uh, are private sector, but they receive a small chunk of the national healthcare service um, uh, uh, vaccination, and uh, uh, citizens over 65 years old were able to receive the vaccine uh, uh, without a prescription, um, and also the, vac the, the community pharmacies were reimbursed with a small fee from the government. So here we have been seeing different uh, testing, different models, testing also different alternatives in order to reach one conclusion, which is maximizing the vaccine co um, vaccination coverage rate. We have other success stories, for example, Italy, first they started um, with uh, COVID-19 and then they got powers to uh, vaccinate against influenza, so a bit of a shift of what, what we have been seeing in other countries. For example, in Germany, first they started with the flu uh, and then with COVID vaccines just two years after, and then Poland that within the same year, um, through uh, mediums of changing law, uh, pharmacies were able to vaccinate first uh, to, against COVID-19 and then just a few months after the service was extended uh, to influenza shots. And this was also based on questionnaire, on data, on uh, evidence-based decisions that governments took. 
also uh, because one of the, the first uh, uh, questions that uh, um, we, we ask for patients who have their shots at community pharmacy is how convenient was it, were you satisfied with the service, how would you rate, would you like to be vaccinated again in a community pharmacy and as you saw before with uh, previous data the response are overwhelmingly positive. And then you ask, is this um, sustainable? Can this continue in, in the next uh, few years, for example, for COVID, for flu? What we see is that we see some strong steps in order to increase the vaccination rate. And yes, up until now, all the stories that we have been telling, they have success. There are also uh, some stories of other countries that had pilot projects. They are still undecided, still trying to divert the data. Uh, also, of course, each country has different laws, different uh, national legislation, and we also need to understand the different roles that healthcare professionals uh, play. In some countries, GPs vaccinate more, in others they are the nurses, in others they are the pharmacists. But disregarded the, disregarding the uh, healthcare professionals' source and background, we all aim for the same aim, which is increasing the vaccination coverage rate. And, and on that note, I'd like to say that PGU is a proud member of the Coalition for Vaccination. The Coalition for Vaccination is a coalition um, that stemmed from the Council recommendations from 2018 and brings together doctors, pharmacists and nurses um, and their uh, European representatives, so CPME, EFN and PGU. And the, the, the reason behind this project is really to increase uh, vaccination rates in, in uh, the European region and fight disinformation and also trying to, as much as, as possible, to um, provide a coherent evidence based and trustworthy information to patients. I would now like to remain available for all your questions and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We already ran out of time, but I hope that it's okay if we continue because it's very interesting and we need to discuss this. So thank you for this very interesting speech. And if anybody has questions to that. Can I intervene quickly or maybe, yeah, you can uh, answer my question in a way. Actually, in Estonia, we do vaccinate in pharmacies, but not the pharmacists themselves administer the vaccines, but they are contracted nurses or whoever healthcare providers. And that is actually very popular in Estonia as well. Uh, we started doing this against flu since 2019, I think, and then also COVID vaccines have been administered in pharmacies like that as well. But yeah, the current Estonian legislations, pharmacists cannot administer vaccines. That's just that. So maybe that is something for us to think about and maybe change the le legislation or also change the training of pharmacists. Yeah, that was my quick. Yeah, was there any fear of side effects and maybe um, hesitancy of the, of the patients, of the people, bef because they fear that if it's not the physician vaccinating, maybe there is more danger of an adverse reaction and what, what happens in case of anaphylaxis? Yeah, so regarding the, the Estonian case, uh, indeed the, the, the map just figure pharmacist-led vaccination in community pharmacy. Regarding uh, adverse drug reactions, um, all pharmacists need to have, for example, an EpiPen in case uh, uh, there is any uh, anaphylactic uh, shock reaction. Uh, pharmacists need, they are trained actually to, to give uh, an EpiPen and also they are trained in CPR. So um, all of the, the, the countries, we, we have seen this. I think it's also a matter of uh, changing culture, which takes time. Um, but we saw, for example, cases of success that started 15 years ago, some others uh, more. Um, and we see that it takes a bit of time, takes maybe one to two decades, but there was a shift in order to, um, to shift really these uh, vaccination services to, uh, for example, the pharmacies. And then actually the, the, the doctors appreciate it because then they have more time to deal with other um, uh, more complex uh, uh, pathologies or more complex cases for patients. So I think it's also it's a win-win situation and uh, especially the patients are uh, thankful for that. Thank you very much. I think even in Finland, it's nurses vaccinating, like at people's homes. We did, I did some immobile patient vaccination. That was a very hard task to do. And uh, in our country, it's only the physicians vaccinating. So we have to actually go visit all the patients. And it was many hours spent driving through Prague here and there, vaccinating very little number of patients. So this would be of great help if, if other health professionals could vaccinate as well. Yeah, and just a, a quick comment. Uh, we see that uh, we have a shortage of health, healthcare professionals. They're 
the shortage existed before, COVID-19 just aggravated it. The um, expert panel on effective ways on investing in health has released a few years ago um, a recommendation on skills mix, so actually understanding how can different healthcare professionals uh, share the same, uh, the same skills, and I think in order to uh, combat and to fight this uh, shortage of healthcare professionals. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, I'll invite uh, Gret Hendricks to, to present, and we still have one more presenter afterwards, so uh, please. Uh, so, um, uh, good evening already. Um, I'm Gret Hendricks from the University of Antwerp, and uh, I represent a little bit Professor Pierre Van Damme, who most of you know. Um, as already said by a lot of people in the room and in the panel. So the role of the healthcare provider is very important in convincing people to get vaccinated. And I would not come from university and not showing data. So here are the numbers. Um, for the European barometer that was done in 2019 and in 2022, it was uh, clear that even before and during the pandemic, 80% of the people from the EU that are surveyed here um, they would consult a doctor before for their information to get their vaccine. Even they see it as you ask them which is the most trustful source, they uh, see the um, GP as the most uh, trustful source. So a lot of people are underestimating uh, the role of the healthcare provider in giving information and in uh, attitude and behavior change of, um, of the patients we call them patients, but of the people to get the vaccine. So they uh, can or uh, increase the attitude and increase the coverage, or they can decrease the co coverage. And one of the reasons is because they are underestimating their own influence. So they don't know how they behave, and they on, only by their behavior they can already uh, convince or not convince uh, the people to get the vaccine. Therefore, we thought that it was important to measure on a systematic way uh, the confidence of the healthcare provider themselves. Therefore, in the joint action of vaccination, uh, where we participated in uh, together with the uh, Flemish agency, we created a kind of survey and we called it the vaccine training barometer, in which we would like to uh, assess the need for training of the healthcare provider, but also monitor the confidence of the healthcare provider. And with this uh, system, with this vaccine training barometer, we also collect questions the healthcare provider could not answer. So here are again uh, data and figures. We did the first pilot round, uh, that's the first column, the second and the third and the third column are more important. These are the blue, uh, the full blue um, um, round that we did in Flanders in December 22 and in uh, the region in Barcelona in Spain. And I don't want to blow the, the party here, but when you see this uh, uh, data, you are really uh, very uh, shocked because only one on three uh, uh, healthcare providers in that region feel confident to even talk about vaccines. So it means that two on three doesn't feel confident. If we ask them um, if they uh, gain sufficient information during their standard education, only 10% and even for Spain it was more, it was the half of them, they gained a lot of uh, enough information in their standard education. Luckily, they are all or most all want to follow uh, the, the uh, training courses. This same uh, barometer was also done uh, in the Coalition for Vaccination uh, with a, a reduced set of, of questions. There it seems that one on two uh, people feel more confident, and, but even there also only one on five uh, got enough information out of their standard education. So if you then ask these people um, where they are going to look for their information about vaccination, astonishing, a lot of healthcare providers are still looking uh, on Google to get their information on vaccination. And everybody knows what is circulating on Google. So um, this was really astonishing for us. As the healthcare providers said uh, that they didn't gain enough information in their standard educations, we surveyed uh, 
more than 3,500 uh, students on uh, the content and how the information was perceived that they get in their education. We did this again with the Coalition for Vaccination and the student uh, organizations that are included in this uh, coalition, so EPSA, EMSA and ENSA. Um, there, it seems that um, more than or um, yeah, less than, than the half of the people that were surveyed found that there was too little time spent on uh, vaccination in their uh, uh, training and a uh, major part were missing. So for 90% of doctors and nurses, major part of vaccination trainings were mi missing in their standard education. And if you then ask them how confident they feel to uh, recommend uh, the vaccines, then it was um, astonishing that half of them would not recommend a uh, COVID vaccine, neither influenza, even uh, well-established MMR, uh, almost 70% they want to uh, recommend, but it means that 30% would not recommend MMR vaccination. And then we are not talking about uh, a uh, a, v a flu vaccination in pregnancy, because that's even worse. So if we ask these students what they need to feel more confident to talk about uh, vaccines, it was uh, especially mentioned that they would like to have an extended model on vaccination in their education and that they would like to have uh, trustful uh, websites or information uh, sites and uh, documented on uh, vaccine recommendations and schemes. So, and if you then ask what they especially were missing in their education, it seems that half of them, and there we have to a little bit uh, take into consideration that we also asked uh, pharmacy students um, that are not really at that moment trained to give practical skills, but half of them uh, are missing practical skills, and even 30% uh, they um, want to have more on communication about vaccination. So, based on all this input on the vaccine training barometer, on the survey of the students, and we made also a list of available, available vaccine, vaccinology courses in Europe, we created or we um, optimized a curriculum for vaccine and vaccination for healthcare providers and for students. This curriculum uh, consists out of uh, eight modules from the history, the immunology, and um, everything that is concerned. It's really an extended module, uh, and uh, we have um, incorporated also a special module on understanding and active listening and communication. These modules, we uh, defined it in the minimum content that should be given in uh, education and the maximum content, and we also include uh, learning outcomes depending if it are students of in-service healthcare providers. This curriculum is now, after a whole a period of validation and co correction, uh, you can find it on the Joint Action uh, website, where the report on this work is now available. So also this curriculum ca can be found over there. Meanwhile, we did a pilot training uh, on this curriculum in the Summer School of Vaccinology that we are already uh, organizing uh, for uh, more than 10 years in our university and also in the vaccine courses that we are giving at our university. So there the curriculum is already pilot tested. It's also validated uh, by the Coalition for Vaccination and by the stakeholders of this coalition. We also have a lot of experience in training uh, of healthcare providers in service training then in our university as we are yearly organizing training for healthcare providers like the Valentin Symposium, but also during the COVID we give some uh, special webinars uh, uh, directed to GPs, pharmacists, physiotherapists, midwives and nurses uh, to have all information on and, and a fact sheet on COVID. Um, but 
We don't want that this is a really an isolated event. We wanted that this kind of trainings would be more accessible uh, for everybody, for all healthcare providers, for all students. And therefore, in the Immunion project, there are other projects already going on on uh, communication because what I missed here in the whole discussion is that you have a lot of science, you have data in science, science for uh, vaccines and everything, but communications itself, it's also a sign, uh, science and it would be very good to uh, implement also this uh, communication uh, science into the training that you are developing and that we try to do to create a multidisciplinary team uh, to make this train the trainer uh, concept on confidence and communication in the immunion project that we uh, launched uh, a few months ago and that is now uh, rolled out in Greece um, and Latvia and uh, also in um, another country that just slipped out my mind, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and the vaccine uh, confidence um, is also, we also give some workshops in um, other uh, side sessions of the international uh, groups of the vaccine confidence pro uh, project. So uh, the taking home message is that um, we must be uh, emphasized that the healthcare provider is a trustful source for vaccination and that their impact is very um, important on the attitude and uh, that to make it very short that we need to have a very structural uh, way of giving this training to healthcare providers and not only to healthcare providers but also to include it in the curriculum of uh, medical uh, students that's the main message that we want to give and that i shorten into the nutshell thank you Gret, very much i hope it's still okay if we at least give five minutes to the last speaker because we, we need this also to hear the perspective of the patient. So please, I invite uh, Ms. Rosa Castro to, uh, to have, have her last speech. Can I have this? Okay, I promise to be brief. I didn't expect the full room, so there's always an advantage of this, but I will be very, very brief. Uh, I think I bring more the perspective of people because the European Public Health Alliance is an NGO. Uh, we're based in Brussels and we have a very diverse membership. So we do have patients, healthcare professionals, but also a lot of health NGOs that represent uh, vulnerable populations or communities that are often left out of the conversation. So what I want to bring is maybe two very quick points on this. So part of the, well, I pre appreciate the, the diversity of this panel too, because when Mr. Uh, Richard, I think, mentioned his experience in vaccine procurement, it, uh, it touched me a little bit because my main role at IFA is actually on access to medicine. So most of what I do is actually looking at pharmaceutical policies and making sure that the vaccines are available for everyone. And, and we are a European organization, but due to the COVID, a lot of our activities have also extended to look at the, at the global issue and equity in vaccines. So that touches me really. Uh, and I think there is a big question here because the more we hear about hesitancy, I don't know you, but the more I, I feel a bit puzzled by these two uh, very weak and very complex situations in which on, on one hand we had very, uh, a lot of problems with the access to vaccines in part of the war and part of the groups that didn't have access because of unavailability of the vaccines, maybe because of high prices or the vaccines didn't reach out to them. And then on the other hand we have groups that have accessibility to vaccines or at, at least in theory the, the vaccines are available, but they are not willing to, to take the vaccine, the first dose, the second, the third. So my first point, I just wanted to bring that IFA at the beginning of the, also the, the COVID, we call on the European institutions and the ECDC actually, so we were heard, uh, for the ECDC and the institutions to have a look at these vulnerable populations. And I just want to mention one specific case, which is the homeless. Uh, people. So, for instance, uh, a lot of research started to look at this and there is some results emerging, especially from a group of, of researchers that look at homeless people living in France 
and they went and interviewed these people and, and there are people that don't have stable housing and live on shelters for instance and there is also like uh, migrants that have uh, recently arrived and are living in these shelters so they found that the vaccine hesitancy uh, uh, among these groups was higher when compared to native uh, let's say the native population so very soon, that was 2020 at the very beginning, so they did phone interviews during the lockdown. And they realized, okay, there is a warning there. We need to reach out to these communities. So I close. I promise to close because you have to wrap up and bring the conversation. I think in, in the whole conversation today, we have also heard about different perspectives, interdisciplinarity here, because a, a lot of people come from the economics, behavioral, uh, legal perspective, or pharmaceutical, of course, and, and the epidemiologist. Uh, and that needs to, I think, come together. So this is a bit of what also we do at, at IFA, we try to do it. But I think we, I want to emphasize the, the aspect of the communities that are often let, left behind uh, or, or left aside from the, um, from this type of discussions, because actually my main message is that we also call for the communities themselves to be involved in all of this. So we heard from the pharmacists, we heard the role of the GPs, but I think a ba basic message is also so look at the communities. I think some people mentioned the social workers, and these were the clear uh, missing link for a lot of these people living in the shelter. So. Uh, it emerged, one of the recommendations of this team of researchers was that the community, the social workers need to be involved since the beginning and that, that was before the, the COVID vaccines was developed, were developed actually. So the same group, which is uh, researchers by, uh, from the INSERM group in France too, are now developing a second part, developed already a second part of interviews looking at, okay, what was the actual uptake of, of vaccines in this population? So, I hear a lot of the, the usual conference, more data is needed and more research is needed, which is sort of not uh, great to hear. But in the case of, of inequalities, I just want to close with this because IFA or flagship uh, program is looking at health inequalities. So inequities actually. So the, the, the type of differences across populations within countries, within regions and specific populations that have different health outcomes but not because of, of factors that we cannot change, actually because of factors that we could change and we should change. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions to this last talk? If not, then I guess we will close up the, both of the panel sessions. So maybe I'll ask first you to close your panel session. No, thank you. Okay, so we'll do this in, in this order. Yeah. Should we stay or we move down? We stay. Okay, we stay. <laughs> so um, I was trying to prepare, but I had very little time and it was so many interesting comments coming from different people and different countries and also so many similarities that we had to face all the same. But. Uh, I feel that the primary care is the first line of uh, care that every person gets in every country. And we have to not forget that it's not only the physicians, but it's also the pharmacists, it's also the nurses, and as we heard, it's also the social workers, and maybe some other, some health assistants, and some other workers that we don't even know about, and we need to evaluate all this system, how all these people can be of help, and we need to cooperate in order to get better vaccination rates and to achieve the goals we would like as much as we know it is important. Um, we need to focus on the clarity of explanations, and perhaps we are not able to do this only using our own education that we had for this time, but we need some expert education and we need to uh, be more advised on how to communicate in media, how to communicate with all types of people, with handicapped people, immobile people, and socially handicapped people, and this all is something we need more time to develop to communicate uh, across all the countries. Some of the knowledge we have gained can be shared, but some cannot be transplanted into another country and maybe 
nationally and even regionally specific, and each country has to analyze why the vaccination rates during COVID pandemics were low in certain areas and go after these factors and analyze them to use to improve uh, the vaccination rates because it's probably going to be similar with COVID and other diseases and this is something we can really profit from now after the pandemics knowing the data and analyzing the data we have. Um, also, I think the main focus now has to be put on training the trainers, because without the trainers, uh, whether it's the GPs themselves, whether it's pharmacists or whether it's professional trainers, medical teachers, faculty members, uh, all these trainers need to be trained more how to communicate with each other and also with the population of all different types. Um, we also need to invite maybe psychologists and sociologists to analyze the factors that we are not familiar with and we don't work with on daily basis. Um, and last but not least, we need to cooperate. Uh, we need to focus on all different modalities on how to improve the vaccination rate. And that is not to only rely on GPs or not to only rely on pharmacists, but also to uh, use every hand that is uh, able to be educated and to help. And if we see there are no uh, increased risks of using these schemes, we should be open to them. And in times of pandemics, uh, when we need to vaccinate faster, of course, we have to use vaccination centers such as most countries have done in, in the pandemics and it showed very effective. So thank you. So thanks very much, I mean, for the uh, very excellent summing up of the, of the panel discussion. And now let me ask another colleague to sum up the other panel discussion that we had. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. Uh, I know we are running out of time, so I'll try to be as brief as, as possible. During our panel, we've uh, touched upon uh, the expert group uh, or expert forum on uh, vaccine hesitancy, which should be one of the deliverables of the council conclusions on vaccination, which should be approved by the ministers uh, during uh, the Czech presidency in a few weeks. So uh, I will, I will uh, briefly just summarize what we found out in conclusion that the scope and purpose of this expert group should be like. I would say that we've agreed that the most important added value of this uh, expert forum should be you know, is seen in ensuring the comprehensive and uh, complex view on the issue of uh, vaccine hesitancy. So that it needs to bring together experts from uh, different, I would say, bodies and different field of expertise to really provide a complex view and tackle the issue of vaccine hesitancy comprehensively. It was also emphasized that uh, the expert forum should a bit broaden its scope and uh, tackle also issues related to ensuring access to vaccines. Furthermore, uh, panelists also agreed that the expert forum should be open to member states, uh, the representatives of Commission, ECDC and EMA, of course, and also to the WHO. But most importantly, we've discussed on the participation of experts. And here, I think that uh, it was very clear that uh, uh, also um, vaccinologists, communication experts, behavior experts, uh, also health professionals uh, and stakeholders, and most importantly, methodologists who would evaluate a bit the factors behind the vaccine hesitancy would be also an important uh, part of this uh, expert forum. And finally, maybe the most important thing that has been discussed was uh, the activities and the focus of the forum which it, uh, which it um, deliver. And here we came to a conclusion that the forum should in particular assist member states with the preparation of communication campaigns and strategies, support them by sharing of best practice or by providing training and workshops. Also, uh, it should emphasize the importance of health literacy. Uh, it should focus on the activities that are aimed at pre-banking the myths and fact-checking. It should also uh, strengthen cooperation with uh, public health at authorities at national level. It should try to address activities at local level. And uh, finally, it was also mentioned that uh, the expert forum should develop an action plan, which should uh, be further monitored and evaluated. Well, this was in brief the summary of uh, main outcomes we concluded during the discussion, and I hope it will be a good and helpful guideline for the Commission when establishing the expert forum. Thank you for your attention. A 
Okay, thank you very much, both Christina and Ludmilla. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes uh, the working session of today. Uh, there shall be a reception in, uh, in about an hour, I believe, at 7 o'clock, downstairs in the restaurant. Uh, and it's probably needless to say, but I, I, I do believe that the social program quite often, you know, helps to establish the working contacts that are uh, quite useful as well, not just the hard work here in the panel discussion. So you are all welcome and all warmly invited. Tomorrow we shall start with uh, welcome coffee at 8.30 and we shall start with our next discussions at 9 o'clock in the morning. So hope to see you at the reception and uh, have a good evening and have a great time in Prague, what shall I say? Thank you. <laughs>